called to attention by Rich Bunch. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, so um, wait for the promo and then we go live. Yep. yep. Yes, please. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Unleash creativity and innovation. Unleash community spirit. Unleash the People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021. Phase 2 presents Visioning Sustainable Futures, Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability. Tune in to the live opening. Join our virtual conference on the 16th and 17th. That's not all. Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop on the 15th and 16th. Come learn from a leading international expert. Everything you need to know to compete in December in our first ever national honey show. Registration is open now. The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus, St. Lucia. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to day two of our country conference. Our theme, Visioning Sustainable Futures, Confronting the Threats of Climate Change and Climate Variability. Uh, my name is Ember Charles. I am the moderator. I'm the chair of the Jeff SGP UNDP National Steering Committee for St. Lucia. Um, Jeff is a partner uh, in this conference with the UMAC with us. Just to remind you briefly, our focus though was on climate change and its change on the fisheries sector. We looked at policy issues, climate change treatment of the destruction of our landscapes, our seascapes and skyscapes in the fiction, fiction and narrative. And um, this morning, our first presenter is Shelly Ann Cox, who I'll introduce in a short while. Um, Shelly Ann Cox will be presenting on the topic during the course of the day. We inviting all participants and presenters to, to complete the evaluation of the, of the conference, um, essentially looking at the, how you assess the presenters and the presentations and also the conference on a whole. So let's go with our first finish after how many years of the drought. Shelly Ann Cox, who's our first presenter, is an early career postdoc associate, research associate at the Center for Management and Environmental Studies, Tumis in Barbados, that's the University of the West Indies, Kivil campus. She holds an interdisciplinary PhD in natural resources management from Kivil campus, a BSc honors in environmental and natural resources management with marine biology, from UWI St. Augustine campus. Shelly Ann has four years experience in applied interdisciplinary climate related research and 10 years experience in fisheries management research. Prior to her appointment at CERNES, Shelly Ann worked for four years at the Caribbean Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology, CIMH. Her main tasks included the development of climate impacts database and assisting with the development of early warning information systems across climate time scales for climate sensitive sectors in the Caribbean. Shelian is adept stakeholder con engagement. She is well known for building, supporting, and sustaining positive and productive relationships with stakeholders in the Caribbean fishing industry. She has a unique aptitude of being immersed in fishing communities and has worked closely with the Caribbean Network for Fish and Folk Organizations, KNFO, since 2017. In her role as Deputy Chairperson of the Fisheries Advisory Committee in Barbados, 
Shellian engages with representatives of various government agencies, including the Fisheries Division and the Ministry of Maritime Affairs, and the, to make a presentation. Thank you, Mr. Um, it's a pleasure being here this morning. A pleasant good morning to everyone listening. Um, I'm quite pleased to be able to present on such an important issue, climate change impact on the Caribbean fishery sector. Um, now, this presentation uh, is a part of an ongoing project called the Climate Change Adaptation in the Eastern Caribbean Fisheries Project. Project is one of our information products that we would have prepared. Um, I've adapted it slightly for this audience, um, but we intend that this presentation can be presented by fisheries management authorities and other stakeholders in the country to where is the awareness, not only around the impacts and the climate stressors, but also around what ongoing adaptation measures have been happening and what supporting policy actions can be put in place um, to reduce vulnerability and increase the resilience to climate risk in the Caribbean. Um, I also thank my co-authors, Professor Oxen Ford and Dr. Monero from FAO um, for their support in, in developing this presentation. Um, so um, before I get into the climate stressors, just wanted to start um, by reminding us why the climate is changing. And this sets the context for the stressors I'm going to outline, as well as the impact pathways. Um, so of course, much discussion has gone about in the past, um, not yesterday, especially about why climate is changing. And of course, this uh, rapid climate change is affecting the entire world as a result of the ongoing release and buildup of greenhouse gases in the earth atmosphere. So you can see, you know, the, the heat being trapped and this results in, in some of the impacts. So what are the main climate stressors that are most relevant for the Caribbean? There are warmer seas, um, sea level rise, strong hurricanes, less predictable sea conditions, changes to ocean currents, extreme weather, and ocean acidification. Um, so we know warmer seas are associated with warmer in temperatures, sea level rise um, as a result of the melting ice and the expansion of the ocean water as it heats, stronger hurricanes um, and more destructive hurricanes resulting from the warmer sea temperatures as well as the, the increase in the levels of moisture in the atmosphere, strong winds, all of them um, causing um, the stronger hurricanes, which we've been seeing in the category fives and so on. Less predictable sea conditions, of course, in terms of the change in the customary wind patterns, um, changes to ocean currents that affect the speed and, and the direction of local tides, and even the, the transport of green water from South America to the Caribbean. We'll talk about how this impacts that. Extreme weather events, droughts, intense rainfall, Ocean acidification, of course, from the increase in the absorption of the atmospheric carbon dioxide by the ocean. Um, so first up, warmer sea temperatures. Now I'm, I'm going to use some graphs from the IPCC uh, fifth assessment report. That's the latest in 2013. We know that they are in process of now releasing the sixth assessment report and we look forward to the results of that. Um, but looking at these two scenarios where we have business as usual and low emissions. Business as usual is um, if we continue as is and we don't lower um, our carbon dioxide emissions. Low emissions scenario, of course, um, is you know, what we hope um, that we would do in terms of aggressive reductions in emissions across the globe. And you know, warmer air temperatures, of course, result in the warmer seas. And here in the Caribbean, the sea has warmed by approximately 1.5 degrees over the last century. And furthermore, by the end of this century, Caribbean sea temperature is expected to rise on average of another 1.4 degrees Celsius compared to the temperature experienced in the period 1986 to 2005. 
and the rising of temperatures will be faster in some parts of the Caribbean, the tropical Western Atlantic. For example, in Northern Brazil, it's expected to heat up faster than the Central Caribbean Sea. And in, in, in addition, seasonal changes in sea temperatures are expected to decrease. So right now, the seasonal temperature range change, sorry, is about 3.3 degrees Celsius. Um, it's expected to drop to just 2.3 Celsius difference over years. So we see here what we have seen in the first panel and what we expect with a business as usual. And, and this would be based on some work by colleagues, um, Nurse and Chalery 2015, um, showing how the temperatures will change um, in the future. And you could see here by looking at the, the legend, um, you see how the temperatures are expected um, to increase over time. We're looking at higher sea levels again, like again using the business as usual scenario and the low emission scenario. And we see that the Caribbean is tracking global changes. Um, and by tracking global changes, um, what is the model predictions? And of course, this is work on downscaling these predictions to the Caribbean circumstance. Um, under the business as usual scenario, the sea levels could rise between 0 0.5 and 1 meters by the end of the century. Under the low emission scenario, um, the prediction is sea level is expected to rise between 0 0.3 and 0 0.6. Um, and the observations, of course, is based to date, but show slow mean sea level rise in the Caribbean uh, of around 1.8 uh, millimeters per year. And some of the work done by our colleagues under the CC for Fish project, um, as I said, a downscale model um, shows the results here of work done for Antigua, um, indicating that expected sea level rise is reaching just over one meter under the business as usual scenario and around 0 0.3 under the um, low emission scenario. Now, stronger hurricanes, what have we seen looking at the decade um, 1970 to 27, 2019, sorry, and what are we to expect? Now, projections are uncertain and varied widely, but there is likely to increase in intensity more category four and five hurricanes, um, very likely to have greater coastal inundation or flooding, and very likely to have higher associated rainfall. And you can see um, this illustrated here. Um, six, you know, and last year, there was expected to be, you know, um, 16 main tropical storms with gusts over 100 kilometers. And we see every year um, that the forecasts are suggesting more intense, stronger hurricanes. Now, changing currents and sea conditions. Now, part of our research always brings us um, to speaking to fisher folk about their observations, you know, um, integrating that scientific knowledge we have with their local knowledge of observing these changes over sometimes, in some cases, 50 years or more. So they're reporting increased storminess, more dangerous waves, unpredictable winds, changes to tides and currents, more seawater, more green water, sorry, and sargasm. And what do we expect? Um, some people think that wave, some suggest that wave heights may lower, um, green water may be around for longer. And then we now know um, and has been uh, researched and there's agreement that sargasm is likely to continue um, for the for the future, foreseeable future. Um, looking at extreme rainfall and drought, this is um, a, a graph taken from our colleague um, Trotman 2019 at CIMH. This is what we've seen in the Caribbean looking from 1975 to 2016. We can see how the years the years that have been extremely wet, those that have been exceptionally dry. Um, of course, the big highlight is the 2010 drought, um, which sometimes this slow moving and onset 
events, we don't really see the impacts. But you know, from from all accounts, when we do look at some of the research that was done into the impacts of the drought, um, there were losses um, in millions of losses over, over that time. So yeah, we need also to um, look out for these extreme rainfall or, or droughts. Um, we would see other indications there of other events. Um, 2015 as well uh, being a very uh, um, dry and extreme rainfall and drought. Again, another product from CIMH. This is their standard precipitation index uh, products. They have one that it's a, that's a monitor, part of the Caribbean and drought precipitation monitoring network. And then they have the outlook. Um, so looking at the latest uh, product that is being released, this one looks at um, rainfall amounts over January to December 2020. And we can see the areas where it is exceptionally dry and, and where it's exceptionally wet. Um, so these products really help um, to inform decision making, um, but also gives us some early warning as well too when we're looking to apply um, these decision makings for, for sector specific decisions. And then looking at the outlook. So we looked at the monitor now and we're looking at the outlook. So what to expect um, up to 20, the end of the century, 2100, Caribbean islands can expect more frequent droughts, more severe droughts, more heavy rainfall effect, events. Now this is um, the alert levels to the end of May, oh, sorry, this should be May 2021, and, and we can see uh, what is expected. Um, ocean acidification. And we know ocean acidification as a change, measured as a change in pH of, of seawater. Um, the lower the pH, the more acid the water. The higher the pH, the more alkaline the water is. Um, so again, another climate change stressor that has been, um, has been identified and is evident in the Caribbean. Um, so what have we seen here? We see um, the saturation rate um, decreasing. Of course, it becomes less suitable for calcifying organisms. And we can expect uh, increased sea surface acidity in the Caribbean. And looking here um, to the decade of 1850 to 1860, um, we, can see, we can see the changes. So as illustrated here, corals and other carbonate organisms, um, you know, they need the cooler colors. And right now we can see um, lots of red there. Um, so based on the prediction, we can expect um, significant impacts. So just to summarize um, a bit of what was said before, for warmer seas, um, in terms of the climate stress, stressors for warmer seas, we can expect um, increased temperatures of 1.4 to 2.2 degrees Celsius and a smaller temperature range. For sea level rise, what we expect is increased one meter, for stronger hurricanes, more category four and five storms and maximum with speeds um, up by 11%, less predictable sea conditions, slightly smaller waves, more green water, changes to currents. Now, these are still a bit of unknowns. A lot of research is still um, going there. So we haven't put a conclusive um, suggestion there. Extreme weather, more heavy rainfall events, and more periods of drought, and then ocean acidification, the increase of pH, and of course, the 32% lower carbonate saturating state of seawater. So that's what we can expect in the Caribbean by 2100. Now looking at the impacts, now that we know the stressors, um, it's best to illustrate this um, using impact pathways. So we have the stressors here on the right and the impact pathways. Um, so of course it affects the fishery sector, it affects the biological productivity, um, captured fisheries, 
aquaculture, community livelihoods, governance, and then the wider society. So as it relates to biological productivity, the impacts on the ecology of marine habitats and the physiology of the marine organisms will affect biological productivity. Captured fisheries, there may be changes in the sustainable yield available to capture fisheries and the effectiveness of capture techniques may be impacted as well. There might be some all, you know, alterations to conditions for aquaculture, for instance, droughts, you know, affecting the availability of water. Um, effects on the well-being of coastal communities and fisher folk livelihoods. There would be some implications for governance, of course, and then, of course, knock-on effects in wider society and the economy. Now, looking at the specific um, impacts first, and then we'll get back to summarize the impact pathways. So less oxygen in the water. Um, so critically low oxygen means uh, fish kills, expanding dead zones, slower growth, and less living space for pelagic species like billfish and tunas. And of course, this less oxygen in the water is a result of the warming sea temperatures. Coral bleaching, again, um, as a result of warming sea temperatures, mass coral bleaching means high coral mortality and loss of reef integrity. So, you know, on the left here, we have illustrated coral bleaching. In some cases, the coral may bounce back. Um, some species are more resilient than others, but in other cases, it leads um, to death. Um, what could be impacted here too is less living space for reef fishes and lobsters that like the, um, the rugosity of the reefs and stuff to hide. And then of course, reefs um, protect our coastline um, you know, they absorb with energy as well too, and this is a significant impact. Um, the warmer sea temperatures also um, represent a scenario where sargasm um, would proliferate. We know that, you know, sargasm influxes have been attributed to warm ocean temperatures as well as nutrient uh, inputs. Um, so now we've been seeing influxes, actually we're seeing influxes now in Barbados again. Uh, we've had reports of Montserrat, St. Kitts, Guadalupe as well, um, all happening right now. And these mass strandings cause oxygen depletion and fish kills as well, drowning of sea turtles. Um, we, we lost about 30 something sea turtles in one influx event in Barbados, um, that was in 2018. Um, damage to beaches, smothering and loss of critical fish habitats um, also leads to clogging of harbors and bays, impedes navigation. Um, you know, fisher folk have reported damage to boat engines, boat engines overheating, of course, because um, of the sargasm getting into their intake systems. Um, as it relates to health impacts, the release of toxic hydrogen sulfide gas as the weed rots, the bad smell affecting fish markets and the health of fisher folk and those persons in coastal communities, uh, damage to tourism as well, loss of additional livelihood for opportunities for fisher folk. And um, uh, beyond those impacts, specific impacts to the fishery sector, uh, we have damage to fishing gear. Um, you know, in conversations with a long length fisher, he lost over $8,000 in fishing gear um, because of um, when they would set it at sea um, and it get tangled in, in the sargasm, um, causing significant loss. Loss of fishing time as well, uh, because the sargasm is at the landing sites, uh, blocking the fishers from going out and being able um, to fish. We've seen reduced flying fish catches um, definitely in Barbados uh, from 2011. You can see um, illustrated here in the graph, um, landing of smaller dolphin fish. I know many of you may have seen some of the smaller sizes of dolphin fish on the market. Um, loss of income for fishers, vendors, and processors. So it's also affecting um, actors across the value chain, the fisheries value chain, and loss of food security. Um, and 
Um, you know, sargassum is not all bad. Um, it is beneficial at sea. It could improve ocean productivity, higher biodiversity supported, availability of new fishery species as well have come on stream. Uh, many of you would have seen the Almaco jacks or Almer fish as we will call it, reports of, of lobs, smaller lobsters being seen. And um, of course, there is exploring sargassum as an opportunity, you know, new income from harvesting and uses. And there are, are many uses that can be explored from construction, activated carbon to cosmetics and so on. Now, fish poisoning and another impact associated with the warmer sea temperatures. Um, warmer temperatures, of course, increase the likelihood of fish spoiling increases the occurrence of cigaretteria poisoning as well, um, affects marketing and human health impacts. Toxic algae blooms again, become more frequent with water warm, warmer waters and high nutrient loads, which leads to shellfish and fish kills. And of course, it is a human health hazard. Uh, we spoke about ocean acidification earlier and the specific impact is that fewer carbonate ions and more hydrogen carbon, hydrogen ions means increased difficulty for building shells for organisms like conch. The coral reef framework may erode. Um, we see here illustrated nerve damage to fish larvae as well, and low fish population replacement. As it relates to sea level rise, um, some of the impacts that we've been seeing, coastal erosion, of course, more flooding with storm surge, damage to critical fish habitats, destruction of coastal property and aquaculture ponds. And um, this picture in the bottom left is actually St. Lucia, um, there in Labrie, uh, where we can see some of the erosion um, that exposes the vulnerability of some of the lockers, fisher lockers uh, on the site. Um, Stronger hurricanes, some of these pictures were taken. Um, the bottom left is Dominica after Hurricane Maria, um, top right um, in the Bahamas. So massive damage to fishery gear, boats and infrastructure. Loss of property and livelihoods. Decreased safety of fisher folk at sea and damage to critical fish habitat. So all of these impacts are already evident in the Caribbean. And you know, our fisher folk are on the front line in this battle against climate change. And at stake, um, at stake is food security as well as even our coastal heritage. Um, flooding, of course, um, damages infrastructures, disrupts fish supply and value chains. Um, now, I, I have quite a few more slides, but I'm going to try to summarize it quickly. Um, in three minutes, um, looking at extreme weather, this is how the drought might limit the water supply that supports fish processing aquaculture. The changes to fish populations reduce spawning success and replenishment of stocks. You might start seeing smaller stock sizes. And of course, the fish distributions will change with rising sea temperatures as stocks start to move northwards. So these impact pathways, um, disruption of marine food webs, damage to critical habitats, as we would have mentioned before, capture fisheries, we'll see lower yields, change in species caught, reduce safety at sea, aquaculture, um, you may see some increase in disease incidences, increasing operational costs, loss of income, reduced well-being um, as it relates to the impact pathway on communities and livelihoods, governance. Now, important changes to appropriate geographical skills if we have stocks moving. Um, increased importance of utilizing fisher folk and scientific um, knowledge um, to contribute to you know, ongoing adaptation measures and wider society and economy. Uh, we have increased poverty and reliance on social protection, reduced food security and nutrition. Um, so looking at some ongoing adaptation measures very quickly, um, early warning, there have been some apps developed for like M Fisheries, as well as the FURA app um, that Fisher Folk have been using, some products from CIMH, as well as the Sargasm Outlook Bulletin that we're producing at Suramese to offer 
um, early warning information, safety at sea training, um, so that fisher folk are armed with the knowledge of how to how to um, be you know put measures in place to be safe at sea and how to use the emergency equipment to call for help if need be. Looking at added value and product traceability, which is a very important um, issue nowadays. Um, we see, you know, I recently saw a subway a article saying that Subway's um, tuna that they are marketing may not be tuna; is a mix of other fish. Hence, why traceability is important. Market diversification: the shift now to amber fish because of the decrease in fish, flying fish, and and dolphin fish numbers. We see some climate-proof infrastructure here. Um, this is the Bridgetown Fishing Complex in Barbados, and you could see. Um, climate proofing of the infrastructure. We see energy efficiency from solar panels, um, that solar powered battery chargers, four stroke engines, insurance streams being, schemes being piloted, of course, by the world. Um, Coast, of course, is a uh, CRIFT and World Bank initiative um, being piloted, but there's some development of innovative parametric insurance for the sector. Capacity building, things like alternative livelihoods, training around sea moss farming, continue to build knowledge and awareness through policy briefs, brochure, this um, presentation itself, um, revising par policy formulation, making sure that climate change is mainstreamed in existing policies and plans, and you know, governance flexibility, highlighting the, the recent climate change adaptation and disaster risk management protocol, uh, which is an annex to the Caribbean Common Fisheries Policy. Stakeholder engagement, um, of course, uh, spoke about the adaptation measures, but these are some supporting policy actions that are needed. Continued stakeholder engagement so that our adaptation measures are suited um, for the local context, you know, ensuring adaptation managers consider gender differences and capitalize on specific skill sets of women, men, and youth, and, you know, um, improving sustainable livelihoods, social protection as well, and of course, uh, improving engagement and support of the private sector to leverage investment in the fishery sector, facilitate innovation and decrease risk. Um, so I had to speed up there at the end, but I hope that it was clear that there is a lot being done. Several strides are being made um, for the ongoing at the adaptation measures in the fishery sector, um, but we still have some work to do and there are the recommendations for the supporting policy actions. Um, we are still on the front line uh, in the battle against climate change and you know, fishers are still fighting to maintain their incomes and catches and livelihoods. I think even at stake, um, the fishery sector um, is still at stake and it needs to be seen as one of the important contributions to the emerging blue economy sector. And then and only then I believe that we could get the type of, of actions that are needed um, to chart the way forward towards um, a resilient Caribbean fisheries sector. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, shelly and to your co-authors, Moreno and Oxenford is the name? Yes, yes, Professor Oxenford, yes. Right, right. I think very, very detailed and good, excellent presentation. Um, I was a bit struck by your, your um, last slide the photograph, which is with an empty canoe approaching the pitons. Um, it's loaded with meaning, but that's not the point of our discussion today. Um, of course, uh, I'm sure that there'll be lots of questions. Um, I know we have some, some of the participants who are, have been associated with the work that you're doing, and if so means as well. So I would now like to invite um, our participants, those on the various platforms to field their questions to you, um, either through the Zoom or through the Facebook. I'll keep on monitoring the Facebook. So you can start. But while you're thinking, I was struck also by one point you made about um, climate proofing infrastructure. 
Is there such a thing as climate proofing infrastructure? <laughs> or you've just coined it? So this is a term that has been used in our in our circles um, in terms of making you know existing structures uh, more resilient to things like um, increased wave activity and so on. Um, things like groins too might be considered climate proof, climate proofing as well to um, to reduce some of the you know increased wave action we've been seeing. Um, so you would see in that picture a lot of the um, dolos, as the Fisher folk refer to them as, um, that secures um, the complex, um, the fisheries complex in Barbados. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I associate proofing like with bulletproof. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, again, <laughs> yes, yeah, some kind of defense mechanism. I believe yeah. um, things like innovative jetty. Um, new jetty designs and so on are also considered in the climate proof infrastructure. Mm -hmm. you participants, you could just raise your hand or unmute those of you who are close to us in the Zoom. Mm -hmm. Those of you who are following on the other platforms can just put your question to either Facebook or YouTube. And um, just to keep ourselves speaking, I think somebody's hand is up, admin. Hi, good morning. Yes, um, Mr. Charles. I was just wondering, um, um, Shelly Ann has provided so much information. I was just wondering how receptive our governments are to this sort of, um, to the, the, you know, the huge amount of information being gathered. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, that information needs to be used to make a difference. Yes, well... I guess in, in our, our sector, we've been trying things, um, of course, coming from academia, you know, we've published a lot, um, but this is not necessarily the platforms that policy makers seek to get their information. So recently we've tried to use platforms like policy briefs, even social media campaigns to try to raise the awareness by simplifying the messages as well. Um, I still think that we are not um, doing enough um, and we need, of course, to really partner with persons who have the expertise in communications and marketing um, to really get um, this information across. Um, you know, I have ideas for guerrilla marketing, um, you know, that kind of provocative marketing that makes people feel uncomfortable, that might be a way um, to start conversations. Um, that we have. Um, they are platforms like the Caribbean uh, Regional Fisheries Mechanism Ministerial Council every year where some of these issues are raised, um, you know, which has led to that um, protocol of, of, of CCA and DRM that's a part of the fisheries policy. Um, but yes, I, I still think um, that we need to distill the messages some more and you know, partner with persons who you know have the expertise in capturing general public's and policymakers' attention. Thank you, Shelian. Any other questions? Hi, uh, Amber. Yes, Jeff. Hi, uh, Dr. Cox. Thanks for an excellent presentation. Thank you. I'm wondering, you know, the, the seas are getting very hazardous out there. Um, and the catches are declining. Yes. And, and more and more, we see uh, aquaponics and mariculture being uh, proposed as uh, ad adaptive methods. Mm -hmm. uh, yet, in the aquaculture sector, we are stuck to one species, tilapia, Mozambique, mm -hmm. I think it's called. Um, and there are issues with that as well. Uh, beyond your assemblage of one species in one place can cause proliferation of disease, which is a principle of an ecological principle. What other species do you see on the horizon that could be used to uh, enter our aquaponics tanks in the Caribbean? Um, um, where are experiments being undertaken to determine the suitability relative to tilapia, the hardiness of tilapia, you know? 
And so uh, is there any experimentation being undertaken in the Caribbean in that area? I know some experimentation is really around crayfish, um, um, the species. Um, I am not an aquaculture expert, I should say, from the get-go. Uh, I like captured fisheries and the ocean. Um, but there are some experience around crayfish, of course, a, a higher priced um, species. And of course, quite hardy as well, too. Um, lots of interest though in mariculture. Barbados did have um, a mariculture operation raising um, dolphin fish, mahi-mahi, and it's something that should, should be explored. In my experience though, um, I think aquaculture may not necessarily be the best alternative livelihood for fishers. Um, we've seen a slow uptake of aquaculture for the fisher folk. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the fisher folk are called to the sea um, you know, it's a part of them, something that's passed on from generation to generation. We've seen better uptake with stuff like sea moss farming, but aquaculture for sure seems to be something that persons in the agriculture sector um, gravitate towards, and that and, and the aquaponics as well too. Also something good for engagement of youth and uh, first, you know, um, trying to, you know, get their interests, you know, through aquaponics and then seeing how they could be engaged in um, small scale fisheries. And any work yet on, on toxic chemicals in, in our pelagics and, and you know, so on as a, as a Jeff person, you know, I, 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 I'm concerned about uh, uh, on your chemical build up in our food chain and uh, you know how fish fish and uh, very susceptible to that. Uh, any work being done on that? And because as we talk about Maricot and, and so on, then I start to think of uh, contaminants on the land based sources of pollution. And I begin to ask myself, people like Chris Corbin up in uh, up in Jamaica will tell you about the increasing contamination and pollution. And we, in the Caribbean as well, we've done some work in San Lucia uh, for some of our projects. I'm, I'm deeply concerned that uh, um, our, our flexibility is, is declining. And I, I am not too sure yet where we're going to go, but uh, whatever policy recommendations would have to transcend the marine and into the terrestrial as well, because somehow we have to get the solution that perhaps is closer to shore and even on on shore you know yes um, i definitely agree um no the i guess the science um is still catching up with things i know we get reports of more incidents of, of cigarette air poisoning in the northern islands um, um particularly with barracuda um and it's different in how the southern part because you know, in Barbados and some of the southern Caribbean countries, we eat a lot of barracuda. It's quite high priced as well. Uh, but uh, more research needs to be done on this. I know colleagues in, in other universities are exploring it, but um, no project or significant research being done in the Caribbean now on, on secretarial poisoning or even the toxic effects on, you know, larger pelagics. Thank you very much. Or, or even with the fisheries division, um, because, you know, there has been plenty of discussions about enhancing the research and development units of the fisheries divisions in the Caribbean. And again, a policy directive that is needed um, if we are going to be dynamic and adapt um, to these, you know, rapid changes that we've been experiencing in the last years. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. And we have a question from Victor Devin, or I'm not too sure if it's David Victor, um, <clears throat> of our Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to read it to you. Say thanks, Shelley, and for this excellent and informative presentation. I just wanted to know is there a regionally considered institutional approach to fight climate change in the Caribbean? Well, um, there is, uh, Five Seas does have um, a policy directive around addressing um, climate change. 
Um, it is, it does need updating. Um, however, um, they would have um, started that initiative and then we see how the other Caribbean agency would have fed into that um, program of action. Um, there still needs to be a bit more coordination, especially as it relates um, to sectoral focus. Um, there are other platforms, um, we spoke a bit about the um, Caribbean Institute for Meteorology, and they, they, do, they have a consortium of, of sectoral partners in the region, so representation from um, tourism with CTO, agriculture with CARDI, CARFA for health, and they all sit around a table and look at the climate services that need to be provided in order to um, inform the decisions that need to be made. I know Dr. Van Der Beek, um, Cedric, my colleague from CNH, presented yesterday, and they are providing quite a bit of climate information products um, that can be tailored to different sectors. They're producing climatic bulletins for the tourism and the health sector, agricultural sector, as it relates now. Um, there is a specific bulletin for fisheries, um, but the Sargasm Outlook Bulletin seeks to try to uh, you know, create that climate product um, to offer some guidance. So there are um, several initiatives, not necessarily coordinated, but I would say that the 5Cs, um, 5Cs initiative um, would seek to, to really um, centralize and coordinate a kind of response in the region. Uh, we do have a lot of climate policies as well, or climate change being mainstreamed in sectoral policies. Um, but yes, there, there needs to be, uh, I guess, a leader. Five Cs could be that leader, and integration with the other sectoral CARICOM agencies in the Caribbean. Uh, Mr. Chair, just one more point, if you if yeah. don't mind. Um, I, I'm actually deeply concerned about the, the fishery sector in the Caribbean. The tiny species, the impact of climate change and so on, increasing pollution in the coastal zone and areas beyond national, national jurisdictions and so on. And, and I'm doubly concerned because when I speak to fishers, um, uh, I would have liked to see what I'm about to say in our local dialect in Quebec. <laughs> Maybe you have uh, evident consciousness in our territorial waters. Um, I remember one big one was in CPC. By land, no, it was some of this by Shinoa. But I don't know if you want to. You're the papa who you're the television. Go ahead, go ahead. Not sufficient cohesion, uh, one might say, and, and coming together to contend with that because where you have, uh, you know, fishing abundance. And then we have foreign intrusion, and, you know, because our protein source is declining. And I'm telling you, we have experimented with other forms. We're going to have a serious deficit in protein. And uh, our palates are uniquely <laughs> North American, you know, <laughs> very, very uh, to change the political issues, the diplomatic issues, and so on. I think that these have been, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Caribbean Large Marine Ecosystem, um, that platform, the strategic action plan that actually identifies, you know, habitat degradation, land-based sources of pollution and overfishing as these three great um, impacts on our system. Now, the strategic action plan now has this um, um, coordinating, uh, interim coordinating mechanism, um, an MOU between um, UNEP and the Caribbean Environment Program, um, IOC Caribbean. And so this is, um, I would think, is the best governance um, coordinating mechanism existing right now to try to, you know, offer that policy directive um, towards the governance of our resources, um, you know, you know, the associated protocols and so on that we need to adhere to um, is a big part of their, their mandate as well. And someone would have referred to Chris as well and others um, doing a lot to make sure that these protocols are adhered to. But I see that 
as that coordinating mechanism as it relates right now. And, you know, many of the persons that sit on that interim um, ICM, as we call it, are very knowledgeable about and have good recommendations to make about the governance of these issues. Um, I, you raised a good point. I mean, we see these in the marine spatial planning um, type of discussions. Um, you know, you know, fishers are also always the ones uh, who tend to suffer in, in, uh, in MSPs. They tend to get all of the you no know, fishing zones. Um, yet, uh, we talk about the polluter pays principle, you know, other actors. And, you know, I, I get it a lot here in Barbados um, with my work and what's going on right now. Even in, in light of COVID, tourism is always the priority. And, you know, we haven't done the studies to really say what um, impact fishing is really having on the marine environment. We, you know, are, we are quite data poor fisheries, um, but we keep pointing, fisher, pointing fingers to fisher folk. And, you know, there's an uprising and the fisher folk are advocated from themselves. The Caribbean Network of Fisher Folk Organizations is doing a good job. They've just finished a regional code of conduct that sets the direction uh, from, from where they want to take fisheries in the future. So there are some strides being made, uh, albeit probably a bit rather slowly, because, you know, we are still trying to catch up with climate change, something that is beyond our control. Uh, but I, I tend to want to remain optimistic, but I think more has been done to really show the importance of fisheries. Sadly, um, the contribution of the fishery sector to the GDP is always small, but that is because, again, data poor. The fisheries, we can't really show our value because, you know, um, the landings data, there's associated issues with the collection of, of the data as it should be. Um, but if we look at if how fisheries really supports the tourism sector and we really value it as it should be, we would see that we should be paying more attention um, and investing more in, in this sector, knowing that it's a climate sensitive sector. And I did, I did enjoy time in, in St. Lucia with some sea egg divers for my research. So, uh, but my patois is a bit bad now. Uh, but yes, yeah, I would have had countless, countless conversations, long interviews with people like Tig and Labry, um, as well to a, a fish port leader seen there about the changes and um, what they're experiencing. Thank you. Thank you, Shelly. Thank mm -hmm. you very much um, for your presentation. Um, our time is up, um, but we just had one qu question from Tessa Smith on Facebook, and she simply asked, what about lobster and conch? Farm. started lobster and conch farming. Um, our Mexican colleagues too have been doing things like building little, I call them little apartments um, for conch, uh, for lobsters where they can, you know, hide in areas where the reef habitat has been destroyed. Um, so there are, are some examples, some lessons learned that can be shared. Um, but of course, all of this um, takes money and a lot of capacity building um, to be um, transferred to other locations. But there are quite good examples. Um, there's also uh, sea eggs, which is close to my heart, um, examples for raising sea urchins, Chardon in the St. Lucian sense. Um, um, but of course, um, these need to be things that can be explored that require funding for sustainability. Thank you, thank you very much. Folks, we just heard the presentation and discussion um, on the topic, the impact of climate change on the fishery sector, which was, of course, led off by Dr. Shelley Ann Cox. And um, through you, we just applauded for our presentation and um, hoping that you can stay with us because I'm sure there will be some projects fund, um, which of course may assist in your own continuing research so forth. Um, just to close it off, I, the image was against this empty canoe, which you presented near the Peter. So to really present the dilemma that we face in the fishery sector in the Caribbean as we go forward. Thank you once again, Patient. Shana will be is the program officer.
she will be presenting on the very brief bio, which I will just read. Um, Government of St. Lucia, first in the fisheries department, and then in sustainable development, where she focused on climate change programs in marine affairs and resource management from the Taiwan Ocean University. Hi, good morning all, happy to be here. All right, so this morning I will be speaking on knowledge management and knowledge platforms with a focus on the OECS region. So I'm sure everybody who's been a part of this conference for the last two days, we've spoken about um, climate change in the Eastern Caribbean um, region. Um, and not just climate change. Uh, here in the Eastern Caribbean, we live in one of the most hazard prone regions. We of course have volcanic eruptions, which we've in the last couple of months been reminded of. Um, seismic activity, storms and hurricanes, and further to that, drought. Climate change adds a new dimension to all of this. Um, we have a possible sea level rise of up to one meter in the future, stronger, so stronger storms, um, an increase in flash floods, um, looking at storm surge and the heights that um, these storms will be coming into, these waves will be coming into the inland of our region, higher temperatures anywhere from one to five degrees Celsius by 2100, um, an increase in the number of heat waves and overall less rain, which of course will lead to more droughts throughout our region. So climate change for us does not have many benefits. Um, a few of the climate change impacts, which we've discussed over the last two days, and I think we're going to continue to discuss today um, as it relates to various sectors. So, for example, in the water sector, which um, across the region continues to be a sector that really is impacted um, negatively by climate change. We see that while our populations are continuing to grow, we also put a higher demand on the water um, that we have, but there's less water available. Um, there's been tremendous damage to our infrastructure in terms of dams and other um, water supply systems. Um, and of course, not having water can have um, spill off effects into human health, agriculture and tourism. Uh, when we look at the agriculture it's, um, sector itself, of course, we know here in St. Lucia, storm damage is very real and it happens even with storms that are not considered to be hurricanes or very strong storms, our agriculture sector can be negatively impacted and, and badly. So um, of course, droughts are going to lead to damage to our agriculture as well. Um, an increase in pests and diseases, um, that resilience, that, that, that good time of, of, of healthy soil, healthy rain, um, lots of sunshine gives our plants they're going to lose because they're going to be stressed from the storm damage and the droughts and, and the fluctuation between those two. Um, we expect to see changes in soil fertility. And of course, I think we've already observing some of that um, seasonal variability as it relates to what crops are available at what times of the year. Um, as it comes to coastal ecosystems, we expect to see more coastal flooding, um, cor coral bleaching as a result of increase in sea surface temperatures, ocean acidification, which is a, considered to be a slow onset event. So it will not impact us right now, but in uh, over time, the acidification of the ocean can lead to serious breakdowns in our corals, um, which of course would have effects for our um, major fisheries. Um, of course, um, coral reefs and seagrass beds, because of sea level rise, they can be submerged at um, sea levels that they would not be able to survive. And as Shelly Ann just spoke about some of the changing um, fisheries impacts that we expect to see, such as changing in fish migration patterns. Uh, uh, housing and buildings. So we're seeing an increase in storm damage on our buildings, um, but also looking at higher indoor temperatures due, due to um, an increase in overall surface temperature. All right, and human health and wellness. Um, of course, climate change makes us more susceptible to vector-borne diseases. Um, there's a higher risk of hygiene related diseases and having outbreaks of such, um, an increased risk of heat stroke. And of course, that's going to have effects on our children in classrooms. Um, 
which are in buildings that were not built to deal with the changes that are coming and also severe damage to our health facilities from storms, but also the increase in temperature. So overall climate change challenges affect every aspect of our life and it calls for a wide range of effective and innovative solutions. And that's something I think this, this conference has really been discussing. Now, for a long time, many saw climate change as the business of governments and diplomats, right? However, now we're in the place where we can say, now almost everyone feels it and who feels it knows it. And so we need to get everyone involved. Um, we need to understand how people experience and view climate change and how we plan our actions around those views and experiences. We also need to engage people from the ground up and work with them to develop appropriate and impactful solutions um, for their climate challenges. And also to ensure that we have access to the knowledge and skills to act appropriately. And that's going to be the focus of the rest of my talk, um, this last bullet, where we look at how we are um, working to engage um, in order to have access to that knowledge that's needed and skills needed. Um, one, of a, one of the approaches that um, has been widely used is that of ecosystem-based adaptation or EBA. Um, and that's really the use of biodiversity and ecosystem services as part of an overall adaptation strategy. Um, and that's in order to help people to adapt to the adverse effects of climate change. Now, effectively Im implemented, EBA can help to sustain livelihoods, build community resilience, reduce financial costs of adaptation, and reduce the need for repeated project-based interventions, which is currently how most islands within our region are, are really addressing some of their challenges. Another aspect to this would be gender equality and social inclusion. Um, and that really focuses on delivering equal rights, opportunity and mainstream services to all citizens, including women, the poor and marginalized or excluded um, groups. Um, it recognizes that there's a gender differentiated vulnerabilities to climate change impacts, as well as the differentiated strengths to adapt to these changes, right? So we don't all experience climate change the same. Um, and we also take into account the particular vulnerabilities of marginalized and high risk social groups, such as the poor, the elderly, children, and the mentally and physically challenged. One of the major barriers to effective climate change action is data, information, and knowledge. And many developing countries, and especially small island developing states like here in St. Lucia, lack all of these within coordinated mechanisms. But there are a few bright spots of this data, information, and knowledge. So we're going to start with a national response to knowledge gaps, and we're going to start right here in St. Lucia. Um, so St. Lucia developed their National Environmental Information System, or the NEIS. Um, it was developed in 2018. The NEIS houses all environmental data that's in all environmental data in St. Lucia, including data related to climate change. This is a shared site that is supported by 17 other government and NGO or non-governmental agencies um, with responsibility for reporting on multinational environmental agreements or NEAs. Um, now, the uh, NEIS, of course, um, allows for all these agencies to input their data and it's a, it's a shared no, um, storage facility and it also has all the reports that can be generated based on that data. And it's free for the public as well as to agencies that may need it. So as students um, who may be engaging in any kind of uh, research, this is a very good source to get um, your information. St. Lucia's NEIS further has identified more than 35 indicators related to the three main multilateral environmental agreements or NEAs. Um, and the three that are focused on right now in the NEIS are the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. There are 18 indi indicators that are monitored under the climate change portfolio. 
right? So that was the national response to our knowledge gaps. Now I'm going to share with you some of OECS's response to these gaps. So in 2020, OECS launched the ADAPT Action Project, which focuses on ecosystem-based adaptation, gender equality, and social inclusion, which I defined before. The major outputs of this project included the integration of citizen participation um, into the local context, promotion of action-based approaches for capacity building, and the development of digital solutions to encourage sustainability and increased stakeholder interaction. Uh, so we recently launched a toolkit to promote um, EBA and gender equality and social inclusion. Um, and it also includes case studies from within our region. This toolkit is accessible on the OECS website. Um, and out of the digital solutions component, it was found that the OEC, in, within the OECS region, there are several local experts in the fields of EBA and GESI. However, no one had a one place where this could be found. Um, and many people throughout our, our region are working in this, and we may not all be aware of that. So a database was developed, um, and it houses right now information on all the experts in the various climate change, um, but also climate change as it relates to gender equality and social inclusion um, experts. And these experts can be found. You have their CVs on there. And so you can always reach out um, if there are questions, if you are interested in any of the work that they've done, because it also has any published work and or projects that they are currently working on. Um, the OECS saw that as this as a major need because throughout the region, there are definitely people working in the various uh, in the various sectors, but we didn't ha ever have a place to put that. And one of the thing is always knowing where to go to find the right people to assist you. And of course, within our um, Caribbean context. So this is the website um, that you can go to uh, and you just go in there. And if you're looking for a, web, a particular um, field of expertise, you would be able to just type it in and you would find those experts in there. If you are an expert and you would like to register, that's also a, a, a place you can go. And we're really trying to build this database up to better serve our entire region so that anybody looking for people with this expertise can easily find it. And these are some of the solutions that we found within the region that are needed. Um, a place where you can have all of these experts in one place um, and that people can then reach out based on their particular needs for um, any climate change work that's being done. So the second um, initiative that the OECS is currently undertaking um, as it re relates to knowledge gaps is under something called the NDCFI. So I'm gonna give you a brief um, OFI is. It is defined as a regional cross-sector and multi-party stakeholder <laughs> consultation and engagement process to support ambitions for climate leadership within the Caribbean. Um, NDCs are uh, the pledge that countries make towards achieving their climate change ambition. And so the NDCFI stands for NDC Finance Initiative. We know one of the major barriers for us within this region is financing. And so this is a, a coming together of, of people for learning and support um, in project preparation and access to finance in order to accelerate NDC implementation and any other complementary actions that may exist. And so this year we are currently working on, in fact, we're in the final stages of launching the NDCFI knowledge platform. Um, and once effectively implemented on this website, we would have um, all the knowledge projects related to NDCs and climate change within our region. Um, but this is going to be a little bit different in that it also has an interactive um, platform with forums where practitioners in the region can get advice, but they can also learn from previous experience. So you can reach out to the various um, people who are within the NDCFI, um, whether it be donor partners, it could be implementing partners, um, or it could be uh, practitioners within the region itself. So there will be open forum discussions on various topics. Um, and you can always generate your own topic if you do want assistance, help, or you want to collaborate. Um, and that's something that we really hope can happen. Um, we really want um, our member states to be able to collaborate on upcoming opportunities. 
we know that within this region, um, doing regional projects does have um, quite a bit of benefit when it comes to administration. Um, you cut administrative costs if you have one central entity administrating the project that can be implemented in several different countries. Um, and also we want to promote, promote the use of digital spaces as a means of regional integration on all things climate change. Uh, because we do know that we are all, um, we're kind of, we're all in this together. We are trying our best. Um, and when one country gets hit by a storm, we all feel it, it reverberates throughout the region. And so having this one location where we can discuss, um, but also share information, have the knowledge products right there and easily accessible to um, all the people in the region is something that we're striving for. We're hoping to be able to launch this uh, particular platform early in March 2021. And my last um, grouping would be the international response to knowledge gaps. And um, first of all, I want to say that there are several of these knowledge platforms um, throughout. The World Bank has, uh, UNEP has, but I'm going to focus on the UNFCCC's um, response to this. Uh, earlier on, like I said, this is the international legal instrument used to deal with um, climate change. Um, and they have developed a specific portal for climate change learning. Now, like I said in the beginning, people, we all experience climate change differently and we all know different parts of it. So the UNFCCC has really put together this one place where it captures a lot of the experiences throughout the world. Um, and they've put it into a form of courses. So the website hosts more than 50 online courses that can be completed anywhere from one to 12 hours um, at your own pace. It has a wide variety of topics from green economy to carbon taxation, to ecosystem-based adaptation, um, and to climate change in things like agriculture, tourism, health. Um, at the end of doing your course, you will receive a digital certificate. Um, and there's also an area where you can put testimonials um, as to where previous users can actually discuss um, what they liked about the course, didn't like, and actually make recommendations over time. Uh, they have vowed to take this into consideration and actually work on, on some of the courses. Um, and this website overall provides a place um, where we can learn about some of the, the common knowledge. Um, on climate change. So there's very basic courses for someone who doesn't know much about the topic all the way up to things like in front of us, we have fiscal policies. Um, it can talk about public finance and how you um, build mainstream climate change into that. So lots and lots of courses at all different levels. Um, and I think that that's very important as you have young people joining the workforce who maybe puts in positions where they don't know much about this topic and they may want to learn more or people who have had ex bad experiences with certain climate impacts who may want to just learn about things you can do to build your resilience, et cetera. Okay, so in wrapping up, I did make recommendations across the three um, um, scales, so national, regional, international platforms. So in St. Lucia, um, while the NEIS is, is groundbreaking in our region for sure, and having something like that is something that is actually being, um, uh, it's being sought after by other islands. I know both Antigua and St. Vincent are interested in creating something like that. Um, it is something, that, there, there does need to be a bit of, um, tweaking in order to allow all data to be uploaded without having to change the current format of the data. So that is a currently a, a slight barrier. It's not major, but it's something that can be changed. And also to have a mechanism for people to speak to the webmaster and possibly to each other while using the platform. Within the OECS, we do need a sustainable plan for the expansion of the databases. And of course, public awareness um, is something that's also important because having the platforms are great, but if people don't know that they're there, that poses an issue. Um, on the international um, front, uh, one thing I do think that UNFCCC needs to do is really create a space for networking. Um, so we have lots and lots of expert databases within the UNFCCC, but there isn't really a place where you can easily be introduced to those people, introduce yourself in order to, again, work together on solving something that, that no one country can, can really solve. 
um, and a space for regions to also meet with each other or like regions. So for example, there are several island regions throughout the world. We need a space for them, for us as island, island practitioners to come together and really be able to, to communicate with each other and also learn from each other's experiences, whether good or bad. Uh, and I think that is it for me. So thank you so much for your attention and I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Shana, for your present. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much. And we will, of course, ask people to stand by to make their comments or ask their questions. I want to remind the participants of and some of the presenters that the Jeff intends to publish the, 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 the in a form that is publishable. Um, additionally, there is an ongoing evaluation of the presentations and the conference. And we just want to remind you to go to the, the link that was sent on comments. Um, I think we have, yes, opening Batsman. Uh, Roy Fedrick. <laughs> As you see, your new, your new ecosystem, right? Indeed. Everybody seems to be adapting ecological terms now, you know, and I wonder sometimes if they know what it means. Um, Egbert will tell us about that as a communications expert. Shana, well then, um, I am wondering though, Shana, you know, there's data, uh, there's the analysis of the data, there's the analysis of the data to bring us new knowledge, new understandings, new perspectives. How do we synthesize new perspectives or new knowledge from this national environmental information system in a really synoptic way for our decision makers to take action? Because, you know, I, <laughs> I've seen so much data in my life telling ourselves how bad we're doing. You know, because every time the data comes out, we repeat the information, uh, we see a decline in performance, we see. So my question is the data, if well stored and well accessed is fantastic. We have improved the knowledge management of the kind. But if we can use it effectively to communicate with our decision makers and our policy makers, that makes the data almost useless. In a sense, it doesn't drive decision making. And maybe our emphasis, we have to use a, a more integrated approach. I'm throwing that out there to the audience to discuss it because there are various entry points for such a discussion. Over to you, Shana. Absolutely, Jao. So um, thanks for that question. And it really is about integration. Um, climate change is not supposed to be an office, one place. Um, you can have one coordinating mechanism but you do need to expand outside of that. And I think what we are slowly and probably not fast, maybe too slowly learning is that we need to show um, when we speak to decision makers, we listen to them all the time. We need to speak their language. We have to communicate to everyone in the language they will understand. Now that's just basic communication skills. Um, I think the problem is that um, people like me, who is a scientist, that's my background, I will speak to you in science because that's what I know. It is to start engaging the communication experts, the marketing experts, and I'm saying marketing now because I think for a long time we just thought of communicating, um, communications experts, but we want the public relations people, the people who take the bad and spin it into a good and into a good message and we carry that on. Now that's a very particular skill and I think the people with those skills aren't really attracted to our particular um, field, but we have to get them there because they too are being impacted. Um, last year, when, when several countries in the world were on fire, I am positive there were public relations people whose houses burned um, or who were impacted negatively by that. Um, and so at this point, I think it, it's really the engagement of that. I think 
Um, within this region, we haven't embraced it quite as we should, but we've seen North America where you have Leonardo DiCaprio, for example, and Zac Efron really coming out and speaking about this. And that's who people listen to. And they're able to break it down into simple ways that us as scientists kind of have to, we say, oh, okay, well, if that's what people will listen to, then let's listen to that. So I think it's engaging at that level. Let's look for marketing specialists and hire them to communicate these messages um, two hours we need it. So I think that's something that we really need to look into in this region. Um, it may cost us a bit, but I think not, act, not acting will cost us more in the long run. So really tailoring our message and looking for that expertise, I think is going to help with bringing on board decision makers. Um, that and the actual storms that unfortunately are coming. Thank you. Thank you for your response, Shana. Um, I, want, I wanted to just, to not to respond to the current discussion, but to go back to the presentation itself. And um, you did mention the, the toolkits that you have prepared being the level of, of, of uptake and use of that toolkit. So it was, it was only completed, I think, in October. So mm -hmm. we can't say for sure what the use of it is right now. We're still waiting for our six month numbers. Um, but overall, there's been quite a bit of training done. There's been quite a bit of engagement done. Um, and it's something that right now, especially EBA is really being looked for. Um, those are the kind of projects that the big funders are looking for. And you must have gender equity within there, you must have social inclusion within there. So we actually think this is one of the more needed um, perspectives. Um, I know my solution colleagues, we've had an experience of, of a funder just being very, very specific about having this gender inclusion. You have to have the points on it, the data on it, the information to go to get this program. So it's something that we think will actually have quite a bit of, of engagement. Um, and we're working with the region to increase the capacity overall. Um, on that um, and the use of it as well. Okay, we have a question from Cuthbert Nathaniel. And he said, you mentioned various courses. Can you provide greater information as how to access such courses? And is there a cost? The actual web page for you. Right. So the ones I mentioned, which are on UNCC Learn, UNCC -E Learn, sorry, one word, dot org. There is no cost to them. You complete them and then you get your certificate of completion at the end of that. Um, so those are completely free. Um, you get everything you, you, you need right there for that particular website. So no cost to that. Okay, thanks. And data sharing platforms, for instance, like the, the NICE, what mechanism is in place to verify credibility of data, that the data is credible, what is being shared on those platforms? So with the NEIS, it's only particular people who can upload the data. So it's the practitioners and the experts within the various ministries and agencies that are able to upload the data. Um, anybody, any student, anybody needing the actual data can go onto the site and download it, but they can't upload that data. So that data is completely um, checked and verified by the various agencies. Um, for, that's for the um, St. Lucia, the National Environmental Information System. So that, that the process by which you are able to um, use the system is you are either a data uploader, curator, or a user. So if you're a user, you're a student in secondary school or, or at tertiary level education and you want information or, or data, you can get the raw data actually on um, GHG emissions by the energy sector. You could go on there, access it, download it, um, and what you do with it is another question, but the actual data can only be uploaded. So that data can only be uploaded by sustainable development, who is the person who collects the data and curates it. Okay. Thank you. I have a, qu a question, a follow up question. Um, well, to that question just posed. Um, in terms of, of strategy by the OECS, what, what many other platforms which, which address the same subject matter. Uh, thanks for that. So with the two ones that I presented on, which is the, um, the expert database 
and of course the knowledge products that are affiliated with that and the NDCFI um, knowledge platform. Um, with the expert database, it was actually just, um, it was born out of coming up with a way in which the region can respond to the needs. Um, it was found by the actual consultants that there were so many people who knew so much about climate change in this region, and yet there was no where where you could find the one place to find them. So you may see Don Pierre Nathaniel on a paper somewhere, um, and on that at that time she worked in departments of fisheries. Um, so she has a, a fisheries expertise, but now she's at sustainable development and another portfolio. Um, but there's no way to know that um, unless you know her. So the reason for that is to really pool all um, our experts into one location so that people looking for experts can find them easily, um, but also so that experts can find each other easily. So that was for the expert database. The NDCFI platform um, really came out of a need to have a place, a virtual place, especially in the last year where we've been trying to have our um, NDCFI forum for over a year now and have been unable to have an in-person meeting. So we thought, let's build a, a, a online place where engagement can continue, um, where people can have questions and have them answered by their colleagues within the region, um, where we can have open discussions on, on issues that we might be facing, or if a funding opportunity comes up, we can share it and countries can decide to collaborate. There is no virtual space right now where that can happen. So both of these were really built out of, out of gaps that we had identified within our region um, for places for people to go and easily access information and data that they needed. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Someone on is up. Oh, I thought I heard a murmur. Um, a follow up, another question from me is um, <clears throat> I think, based on what I think, um, to empower people um, who have to get policymakers to implement and, and develop policy. The point of, of the ADAPT Action Project was really to empower citizens at their where they are to share their information, share their knowledge. Some of the toolkits, they, it was really built from local knowledge um, and local examples of ecosystem-based adaptation that's happening that they may not even know that that's what it's called. You know, that might not be the term we use when we go in and do serious mangrove um, reforestation. When we go in and do um, serious rainforest reforestation, when where we... Um, are looking at coral reefs and how to make them more resilient. Um, all of those are examples of ecosystem-based adaptation um, at the local level. And it was happening throughout the region. Um, and that's where several of our state case studies will focus um, on really getting communities. And, and we work with communities and we build from there. That, that's part of our role um, in our unit is really to engage communities in building their resilience. And the hope is that that will then build up into communities, building up into actual countries, um, and then a region that is that is empowered to do what needs to be done. Uh, yes, Mr. Romulus. Thank you, Mr. Charles. Um, one of the problems in the Caribbean is access to sensitive information and information that could be very useful in policy development and strategizing. Uh, is the OCS doing anything on the access to information rights uh, of uh, the public or the, uh, of the, of the, um, of persons to access the information for decision making? I also want to draw to, to appoint me by Professor Audrey in the People's Parliament in November, where she's head of services, um, South Africa Institute for Social and Economic Research at Mona, that in the Caribbean politicians are notorious for making decisions without data and for being so impatient that they approve a study before the study vision. And isn't there information that uh, that might come to you that might be classified uh, not for the public. Uh, uh, particularly, I can think of uh, in recent times, the last two years, the issue of pollution in certain eastern Caribbean islands. Water uh, quality? Of the archipelago. 
to <laughs> yes, and uh, you can't say anything because every country believes that it's going to touch their reputation. So you cannot use the, the shame uh, rod to persuade change or to persuade, and therefore you are muffled. And therefore, we continue to tell ourselves we are doing studies, but the studies tell us, you know, we're doing uh, bad and bad and bad and worse and worse and worse and worse, you know. Um, I, I am going to say a, a new theology for sustainable development, you know, when we talk about value systems that drive us, because I really believe I, I am, I'm reaching the point where I don't think science is going to make us, is going to change our hearts and change the attitudes you have towards the environment. Because this action is being taken. Look at this water is happening in the US, I suppose in the first world country with the uh, most Nobel Prize winners in science and physics and so on, and yet a, a nation you know, making decisions like that. So the question is, have we thrown rational thought out of the dogs? So the issue of access, uh, I don't know if you can uh, touch on that, uh, Shana, and uh, maybe uh, Amber as a communications expert can touch on that as well. Thank you. No problem. So as it relates to access to information, that's a various member states issue. So within the member states, while we are encouraging them, for example, to sign on to the Escazú agreement, um, that's what we can do is encourage. But again, I think it goes back to Mr. Charles's question before about engagement of communities. Um, we the people have the power um, as we build on that, as, as we create citizen scientists, um, whereas I, I agree with you that science is losing its ability to stand. I think citizen science where people look, find the problem and find the solution within themselves, they see things different and they can possibly make that, that, that noise um, that's needed in order to get the right attention. And you can see a, a, a problem and you can find solutions innovative within your community and hopefully those are ecosystem based because nature is for within the, the OECS. Thank you. And since I was scheduled, I will. Democracy, sorry. Um, I think just to, to use Jeff terminology, I will up with you sometime. That perhaps we need to look at an SG, SDG number 18, which is communication. You know, a number of the institutions which had presented platforms for public discussion are no longer there. We should make every effort, you know, there are pros and cons of, of unbridled use of social media platform. But if we're able to convert these into communities for people to access information, and again, it, it has, there has, there's also sort of the back engine of making the information to go in depth here, but just to put it on the table, maybe going forward as you propose, in, in, in our work at the OECS, having myself been there through the Natural Resource Management Unit many years ago and trying, are the policymakers or are the people? This is a, a perpetual dilemma, usually on the value. Um, usually second thoughts. Um, besides, we spend so much time and resources on the production of messages and so forth. The budget is finished. You don't have enough money to distribute the message. You get a few slots on radio here and there, and then after that, front in terms of trying to address the deficiencies of knowledge management, till discussion for a different time. And I'm sure Jeff can... <laughs> Since you're the chair of the board, uh, we'll facilitate your <laughs> passage of such a proposal when it comes to our desk. And just, just one point though, I, I am, I've always been concerned about uh, the difference between correlation and causation. Um, let me give you a, a wonderful example. In uh, a certain community in Solution, there was a rise in enteric disease and gastrointestinal intestinal problems. And the science center, the hospital. You know what the doctor writes gastrointestinal, but he doesn't say where it comes from. Now, you know, gastrointestinal can be caused by the, the food you ate last night that was in the refrigerator for three days, or the roti that wasn't well cooked or, or well warmed because diseases have entered it and bacteria has entered it. We are not, the, the, the information is there. On, it seems to me that unless we begin to reconnect it with the, the water quality that the, the children and the people who are bathing in. 
until some becomes a, a, a national issue, uh, maybe the way we present, we need to find, uh, we need to do studies that prove causation. We know the cancers are more complex. We accept the, to, to, to establish the position. And, and, and Dr. Gabriel was saying the same thing in the Purple's Parliament, is documented. So maybe the presentation of the data too. I don't know. I pause. <laughs> Um, again, we leave with questions to ponder on, and I hope, you know, going forward, invite our next presenter of forestry, Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Physical Planning, Natural Forestry Divisions Research on the Lansan Tree in St. Lucia, that lay of bioinformation. Uh, Nicole just wants us to know that she's the education officer who will assess. Okay, over to you. Information on behalf of the forestry department. Um, we will begin by just viewing a short film or video. So I'm going to share now. Everyone can see? Yes, yes. Packet of incense from St. Lucia. But this time I want to tell you what I found out when I went to buy it from a dying out. It was a shock, I can tell you. I don't want to be responsible for destroying our forest. She introduced me to Monty, who works for the forestry department. He told me they want to protect the tree, but they don't want to stop people from getting insects. He offered to show me how we can all get what we need. The intense comes from the lesser tree, and Telenusha is one of the few places where these trees can still be found. When the tapas cut away too much back to get the resin that the incense is made from, the trees get infected and turn rotten. This tree probably dies. They've developed a new technique that doesn't harm the tree and is even more effective at getting the resin. They're now training tapas and giving them their own plots and a special license to do it. The lassa is a very special tree. As well as making incense, birds and other wildlife eat the fruits. It's a part of all the different species that make up the forest. Monty invited me to bring my children to enjoy this place. And you must come too when you next visit. We've been missing out on one of the most amazing places on earth. So now you know. Please tell anyone else you know who uses this incense. It also helps to keep the mosquitoes away. Well, this was my this is my presentation in a nutshell. I hope that everyone enjoyed viewing this video. So I will expound a little further. Yes, yeah, so we're looking at sustainable harvesting of the lesser resin in St. Lucia, and we worked with various partners um, to get this accomplished. 
we, we recognize that there existed a problem. And the main problem is that there, there, there's over-exploitation and there's a great decline of the species. And we found that there are very few remaining populations of let's say Guadeloupe and Martinique. And surveys that were done in 2014, 2015 found that there were no, no populations in St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Okay, and that according to IUCN Red List, it is categorized as being an endangered species. And we have even high mortality right here in St. Lucia because of opportunistic tappers. This is just a photo showing some of the, one of the ways the opportunistic tappers um, harvest, they would slash the tree indiscriminately. And what you'd find happening is that you'd find the tree eventually rotting, snapping, and dying. You want to switch to the photo? Still have the video. The video is still there? Yes. OK, let me. Because I minimize it just now. I'll close it. We have someone on the Zoom who we have some echo from there. Whoever has their mic open. Okay. Okay, there you are. We could see the presentation now? Yes. Okay. Yes. So sustainable harvesting of the lassa or the, the incense in St. Lucia. Like I said, the, the major problem that was identified is that you have a sharp decline of the population because of overexploitation. Also, we found that there are very few um, plants or, pop or population in Guadeloupe and Martinique. And that recent studies um, that were done in 2014, 2015 found that they have none left, none of the species left in St. Kitts and Nevis and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Also, we found that um, even right here in St. Lucia, which has the largest stand of, of the Lassa population, that they have high mortality rates. And according to, like I said, IUCN, it is considered an endangered species. Um, I, you could see the photo now? Yes, this is just a photo showing. Yes, yes, we can. OK, thank you. Showing the results of what happens when people indiscriminately harvest the lesser. So we have a lot of opportunistic tappers. They would come and they would slash the tree indiscriminately, not using any particular technique or methodology. And what we found would happen is that you'd have a lot of the trees dying. Well, yes, the lesser is a, is a flowering plant and it's endemic to the Eastern Caribbean. And uh, it's the third commonest species that is found in, in our forest. So we have a, a pretty healthy population for now in St. Lucia. The ecological range is Dominica, Guadeloupe, Jamaica, Martinique, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Vincent, and St. Lucia. But what we have found is that in a, a recent survey, they have no population left in St. Kitts and Nevis, none in St. Vincent and Grenadines, and in, and in the other islands, the population is very small. And Dominica is yet to be reevaluated post um, Hurricane Maria in 2017. And we know great damage was done to their forest in Dominica because of that hurricane. So then again, another threat to the population of the Lhasa. This map shows the two of the sites that were used to carry out the experiments. We had plots in Chasse in Babono and, and on the Bad Lille. And, and forestry division employees, staff, along with fauna and flora staff, as, as well as tappers worked in those areas during that time. Now, some of the actual uses and potential use of the LASA medicinal. For instance, a lot of people use the LASA they will put it in coconut oil and they would rub themselves with it for, for joint pain and uh, arthritis. And some people, they would pour hot water on it and they would inhale it to, to help decongest them and to clear up their sinuses. Of course, um, if we have any persons who are Catholic or anyone who has been to a Catholic church, we know 
that the incense is widely used in the Catholic Church where they put it and smoke it and to bless the place, etc. Some people in religious rites use it to um, dispel evil spirits. It is also used as an insect repellent. Locally, some people would burn it, the, the, the raw incense in small coal pots and, the, and smoke out the place to, to repel mosquitoes. And I, a lot of us, when we go to the forest, at least we forestry staff, when we take the skin of, of, the, of, the, of the seed itself, when you squeeze it, there would be a nice um, oil that it exudes and we'd rub it on ourselves and even that would help to repel mosquitoes. And that is why we think there's a lot of scope for, for using the lesser to create essential oils and to use in aromatherapy, et cetera. Now, in light of the problem, this sharp decline and even the loss of the species in, in other Caribbean sister islands, other countries, um, the solutions we found are the following. So we had the objective to analyze data trends of the quantity of lesser resin produced per tree per month in the various studies done before 2011, 2012, and 2016 using a standard cut and 5% sulfuric acid. Also to assess the health and the conditions of the lesser trees that were harvested in 2016. And to interview and record the lesser tapper's perceptions of satisfaction and usefulness of the pilot project of 2016 to harvest the lesser resin in the forest reserve. Now, a lot of what I'll be presenting today will be focused on the 2016 pilot research that was done. But in 2011 to 2013, 2014, there about, we carried out a research experiment where different types of cuts were used to see which one exudes good quantity and quality of resin without actually harming the trees or causing their death or destruction. So in 2016, what, what the forestry department did is that four, four tappers and those tappers in speaking with them tell us that the lesser they sell at least um, supplements their, their income by at least 25 to 30%. And they rely heavily on, on tapping of the lesser. And a lot of the, the tappers, the, the four tappers involved and many of the others we spoke to, a lot of them are from rural areas and they do a little subsistent farming. So it's a really big deal to them having the opportunity to tap into that lesser and make extra income. So each tapper was allowed to tap 60 trees in the Badlil forest. So the forestry department, we allotted the plots to them. Each plot had 60 trees and they were supposed to apply the approved method that we came up with from the previous research experiments. And that is making one small incision in the back of the tree every two weeks and spraying a solution of 5% of sulfuric acid. So they would make that small incision, spray a little sulfuric acid, 5% solution. And after two weeks, they would come and harvest. And then they would, make a, they would deepen the cut a little or make another slight incision and spray the acid again. And then all that information in terms of the quantity of the resin was collected and weighed by us. Now, we use several indicators. Um, to evaluate the health of the tree. But one of the key ones based on literature um, review and research was the presence of the termite trails. A lot of literature said if they have a lot of termite trails, usually four or five and more, then most likely that tree is very sick and it will die. So although we looked at several indicators, in this presentation, you'll, more, you'll see um, relation more with the termite trails present. Also, the, the lesser tappers, we interviewed them because we wanted to know, get feedback from them. How did they feel about the quantity of resin they, they, they received using the approved method, the quality of the, of, of the resin, et cetera? So these are some of the variables we used to, or indicators we used to evaluate the, the health of the trees after they were tapped. Now, these, these were done before the tree was tapped, during the tapping period, and a year after 
seven months and then a year after. So we looked at tree growth. We look at the crown health. We look at the number of termite tunnels. We look at the, the can number of cankers on the trees. We looked at if there was any presence of fungi. We also looked at if there were any cavities or number of cavities. Now, this just shows the quantity of luster that, that was collected per tree per month during the period of May to December 2011 and January to March 2012 and March to August 2016. And what we notice is that over time, there was linear progression. Over time, we found that more lesser resin was produced. And that the minimum that was collected per tree per month in 2016 was 7.8 grams. That's the minimum. And compared to the, the maximum that was collected in 2011 when we were just starting off the process. So over time, we saw that there was an increase in the, in, the, in the amount of resin or the amount of luster that was collected. As I said, results show tappers can obtain more resin and maintain healthy population by tapping mature trees at breast height. Now, breast height is usually 1.3 meters from the base of the tree, of the, of the tree trunk, of the stem, to as high as two meters in some cases. So not higher than two meters, so at breast height. They could tap into those trees. And we found that certain quantity of resins and the health of the tree remained intact. So we encourage, we, we encourage the tappers to, to tap into mature trees with at least diameters of 20 centimeters and more. And of course, apply the 5% solution of sulfuric acid. So that was found to be the best method which maintained the health of the tree and also gave quality resin or less in terms of quantity and quality. This is just a graph showing the four, the four plots using the four different tappers, the, 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 what was obtained. Yeah, as, as, I, I, as was previously said, each tap had 60 trees and there were four tappers, so 240 tree, 40 trees in all were tapped. And then we saw that there was a linear increase in the quantity of lancer harvested during that time. And we had a, a, a maximum yield of 2,500 grams and a minimum yield of 150 grams. Um, the average mean yield was 796 grams for, for per plot in the experiment. Here, we found that in 2011, when the, the research started, the average number of termite trails was about one. And even after tapping using the approved method in 2016, we found that there was no change. So that was also an indication that um, damage to the tree was minimal. Um, in the Shasta area, we did not, there were not any tap trees for the 2016 pilot project. That project, pilot project happened in on the Bad Lil only. Um, as this says, two tappers were interviewed um, in terms of those who participated. And also other tappers, there we have to, but we also had conversation with other tappers, asking them what did they think about use, it, use of the method, the amount and quanti the quantity and quality of the lesser produced. And the feedback we got was very positive. And, uh, they, they agreed that it is something they would like to continue because they want sustainability. They want to be able to keep coming back and knowing they have a source of income because a lot of them, they're really struggling. Like I said, a lot of them were just um, subsistent farmers. So the income that they would generate from the lesser really helped their, their situation and improved their lives. Also a blind survey found that the consumers could not distinguish between the incense produced with or without the stimulant. And the stimulant that we're talking about is the 5% solution sulfuric acid. Now, one of the things we did to test that um, during that consumer survey is that we brought incense, both those that were tapped without the sulfuric acid and those tapped with the sulfuric acid, we brought it to seven parishes around St. Lucia, Barbono, Ancillary and Canaries, um, Soufre, 
and they were given to the to the priests to use during their religious ceremonies and uh, they they were asked to monitor the color of the smoke the scent how quickly it burns and honestly none of them could tell the difference none so it shows that the method that we're encouraging the tapas to use actually indeed works and doesn't affect how the lesser burns, the scent of the lesser, et cetera. Now, these are just some information we got from, from the tapas themselves, those who volunteered to speak with us. And also when we spoke to vendors in the market, they would send about a pound of lesser, about $25 to the local vendors. And I'm sure all of you at one point or the other have been to the market you will see the vendors selling the small little portions, maybe maybe just a, a, a 30, 40 grams in a small white bag and they sell it for $5 per person. But some of the tapas said, if they have two pounds of lesser, depending on which part of Martinique, they could get as, they could get 40 euros for the two pounds and sometimes as much as a hundred euros. Depends on who the buyer is in Martinique and what part of Martinique. So that is very encouraging. In conclusion, in 2011 and 2013, the St. Lucia Forestry Division and Fauna and Flora International determined that the method of one cut of the back at the diameter height, at the uh, di diameter breast height, an application of a 5% solution sulfuric acid was the best harvesting strategy to extract the lesser. Um, so that it's sustainable and that would not cause harm to the trees. Also, this was tested in 2016, and we found that the production of the LUSA, the yields even increased in 2016 compared to when the trials and the first experiments were done during 2011 and 2013, and that the trees remained healthy. So we have deduced that the methodology can be adopted and it can be replicated throughout St. Lucia and other, other um, Caribbean islands who still have the, the lesser tree and who are willing to, well, where people ex, um, do extraction so they can do it in a sustainable way. What currently exists? We have a draft management plan from 2018. Um, there's a proven and effective tap, um, tapping methodology which maintains the health of the plants. So we know that. And it is a livelihood activity with great potential to grow because we could do value added and really increase the level of income that these tappers can get. What's needed? We need to implement the lesser management plan. We need certification and licensing of tappers and buyers. We need more market research, especially to enhance the added value that can be gotten from the lesser resin and derivatives because um, lesser is a non-timber forest product and in other parts of the world exudes and resins make millions of dollars they use it in vanishes in paints in pharmaceuticals so there is potential and um, we need further research on the lesser plants to correlate between the health and the resin production because during these studies, we did not focus a lot on, for instance, the climatic condition. Um, in speaking to some of the tapas, some did say, for instance, if some of the, the lesser trees were closer to river courses, they would probably get a, a, a higher exude, but a thinner exude. But in the implementation, um, in the management plan, things like that are, are, are stipulated. How far from a water source should you tap? For instance, we say there should be a buffer, locations of trees that should and shouldn't be tapped, the diameter size that are apt for tapped in. So the management plan, we need to implement it and to give certification and licensing. Um, further training of the technique, and you know, we need to promote that and to help empower private landowners because there are private landowners who have lesser stands on the on the on the land. So for them to consider it as a viable option and include it in their business portfolio. Because a lot of people, private owners who have forests, honestly, in the work we do as forestry, when we speak to a lot of them, they think about cutting it down, using it for development. 
but we need to push green economy activities. We need to show them that they have a wealth on their land that can be used to generate income without destroying the environment, which will make us more resilient to climate change and which will provide bread on the table for our people, money in their pockets, because we need money to do everything. Um, what is also needed, enforcement and penalties for illegal access and breach of contract. Where, because even a lot of the stands of LASA is found in the forest reserve, owned by the government, owned by us, the people. And we still have people, we still have issues where some people enter illegally because for you to enter the forest reserve, you must have permission from the forestry department. And some people enter illegally to do tapping. So we have to do a lot of monitoring. So we need some kind of enforcement and penalties. And a lot of that feedback we receive from the tappers themselves, because sometimes they would have conflict. Some tappers would go in, they would harvest in what is considered a sustainable manner. And other opportunistic tappers would come in and they would take the lesser that they, they did from the trees they already tapped or indiscriminately tap and cause destruction to the very trees that they're depending on for supplementary income. So we need enforcement and we need, we need to um, have penalties for illegal access and breach. And on that note, I'd like to say thank you very much. And any questions? My, my colleague Donatien Gustav is also there to assist with any questions you may have concerning this presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Nicole. My pleasure. Very detailed and very informative presentation, very good. I think that um, for those of us who may be unfamiliar, um, I do forest work, so I'm familiar with some of the territories you mentioned. Okay. But my, I would just invite our, our followers to fill their questions. Um, but a very obvious question I've asked before, um, the response is, first of all, I assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the demand is coming from Martinique, high demand is coming from Martinique. Is that correct? Yes, sir. A, high, a, high demand. a high demand, I'm getting some feedback. A high demand is coming from, from Martinique and also the fact that we have a local based market with the Catholic churches who okay. use the incense. So if, if there is a demand, why hasn't there been any propagation and planting of nursery trees in Martinique to supply themselves? That is a very good question. And in all honesty, I do not know. <laughs> I don't know if my, if my, if my colleague Donatien can shed any further light on this. Donatien, can you? Can you? Can you? Can you? Yeah, well, good morning, well, good morning, everyone. everyone. I, think I think the major, major, the major, the major challenge, challenge is, is not, not being able, able to control, control the demand in Martinique. Martinique. Remember, Remember just, 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 just one other minute. Admin, we're getting your feedback. You can go ahead. You hang me? Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead now. Yeah, I was saying the major challenge is there has always been a demand for Lhasa in these territories, the French territories, the Guadeloupe, Martinique. And it is because of that demand, there was the demise of Lhasa there. Fortunately, by divine intervention, by the work of persons like Gabriel Coco Charles, it didn't happen in St. Lucia. So we're fortunate that it's happening here. And I want to add very quickly that we have been successful in propagating and enriching forest with Luxembourg. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question from Don here, Nathaniel. And she asked, she said, very interesting presentation. Noting possible sale of $25 per pound locally and 40 euros per two pounds in Marti. Can you comment on the current legal economic gains livelihoods from sustainable harvesting 
How are tappers gaining access to sulfuric acid for the, for the technique? Has the department considered co-management as a way of to encourage sustainable harvesting, noting that the trees are largely found? Uh, sorry. This, uh, yeah, are largely found in reserves. Any of you? Okay, you well, I, I, you, you I got can, the question? I, well, I got, I got part of it for sure. I can comment. Have we yeah, as the yeah. department considered co-management? Yeah. We yeah. have, like, like was said and like you said, Dawn, a lot of the uh, large population of the Lassay is found in the forest reserve, which we help manage the forestry division. So we have considered and in the management plan that we have, this is what it encourages, co-management, because we would have to monitor them. We actually take in record of what is harvested. We monitor what they do. We monitor the plants as well. And as for how they obtain the sulfuric acid, we obtain sulfuric acid through Fauna Flora International. And currently, we are the ones providing the tappers who have permission to enter with the sulfuric acid. But for instance, in the previous research, they used higher concentrations of sulfuric acid, but it was found that it might be something that might be too dangerous for the tappers, for the users. So then the 5% concentration was seen to be apt. And in the management plan, um, it is itinerated that, for instance, access could be obtained where we have an agreement with certain pharmacies and Renwick so that the, they can access the sulfuric acid. But for now, we don't want forestry department giving the sulfuric acid to the tappers who have permission to access the forest reserve to do their tapping. So when they're about to tap, they call us, we go in with them. Also the resin they collected, they bring it to the office, which is right near to the, to the tapping area. We, we take the weight and we fill out a form. So we have that data there and we feed that data into our into our local forest um, management information system in the department. May I add something? Yes, go ahead. Yes, well, three aspects. One, one of the, the key actions on the way forward is to do a marketing study. Two, we deliberately did a trial with community personnel to work out a strategy to see how we can operationalize working with communities and it was successful. Finally, all of this is geared towards one, co-management with communities, but also to promote private forestry with lots of persons who have the private holdings. They can be familiar with a procedure where they can diversify income, ecotourism, agroforestry, but with lesser. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I have a question from Nintas McGray. He said, can other parts of the plant be used to extract the oil, leaves, etc." Could you repeat that question, please? Can other parts of the plant be used to extract the oil, the leaves, etc.? Well, the when you cut into the tree bark, you get the resin, but you'd get, for instance, the oils, you would get it from the skin of the fruit. So that's where the, the skin of the fruits would exude a lot of the oil, which we believe can be used be an essential oil and there's potential for that development. Okay, another question comes from uh Good, good, good day. Yes. Yes, I'm um, Carl Augustine from the Forestry Division. Oh, Sub yes, go, forestry Division. go ahead. Um, just go to ahead. interject, um, uh -huh. there is already some work being done with uh, a, small, a small entity who actually do um, essential oils for perfumery and so on, where some of the, the leaves, the foliage of the Lhasa, was used for the extraction of oil, right? So, 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 so that is something that is actually already happening. And what the plan is, 
is to actually look at developing a different set of management protocol for the trees, right? To favor that type of um, sustainable use. So we will look at an approach similar to the ones taken with species like um, um, the bee. Okay, Sorry. comment. Can I give some feedback as well? Yes, go ahead, Nandarachian, go ahead. We really don't know which part of the plant has the highest concentration of essential oils or active ingredients. This is why we are actively seeking characterization of the tree from the leaves, the roots, the bark, the fruits, to know what is present, the proportions in the different parts of the plant. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Nicole, I have <clears throat> two, two questions. One, <clears throat> it says, what qualifies? Well, one of the things, at least with the train tappers, we have an arrangement with them where they <clears throat> inform us before they come, they, we've given them permission to have access to the forest. And then we go in and we monitor. Also, um, part of our patrol and surveillance and monitoring work involves monitoring the, the activities which takes place in the forest reserve. But one or two do slip through the cracks and do enter some of the forest reserve. We find in, especially in, in Chasse area, that we do have some illegal tappers who sometimes get in and and harvest the lesser, not in the sustainable manner where the train tappers were taught. So we still have some work to do, but we do monitoring and we do surveillance of especially the areas we know they normally access to minimize on, on, on overexploitation. Yeah, I guess the question was, is, I guess follow, follow through is the extent to which you, you could assess the yield of a particular plant. So you are, you are not over harvesting. Um, can I can I also interject again? Go ahead. Um, two things, yes. Um, but we do recognize, just to say what, just to continue build on what um, Nico just said, that this is why it is critical to continue or to have a robust um, program for training um, more within our society, within our communities, right? And to also even target those who are who privately own Lhasa. Right, so that to ensure that the, the, the new approach, both for tapping and tree management, reaches a certain critical mass um, within the, 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 the St. Lucian society. Right, so, so, so this is one of the things that we want to, to ensure that we piggyback on. Okay, dear question. And the next thing is in terms of um, the issue of um, over harvested in the method that we do. There is part of the recommendation moving forward is to um, only tap for a certain number of years continuously and then to have a, a follow, a, a period um, where, the, where the trees are left for, for a couple of years to, um, to regenerate, rejuvenate themselves. But this, there is where now the continuous monitoring is essential so that you could be applying the assessment used um, for gauging the health of the other tree. And then now probably make your management decision based on this. Thanks. There are two questions from Cuthbert Nathaniel. I, I think Nicole may have addressed the first one, which is, has the department given due consider consideration for replanting to ensure sustainability? I think you spoke of some other areas that you attempting to get some of these. You can also sort of repeat it. But his follow-up question is, what qualifies a tapper to extract the resin and not another? I guess, what, what, are, what are the, the qualification um, um, criteria for being a tapper? Okay, well, when, when we started this research, persons were already involved in doing tapping. So the, the one, one of the main objectives we had was to train them and then to further license them and to certify them. 
So what qualifies someone to, to be a tapper? Well, we want sustainable tappers, so we're training, but they already have tappers out there. Unfortunately, too many of them are opportunistic tappers. So as being said, we want to, part of our management strategy is to, because we've identified quite a few of them, is to do further training and continuous training and to certify them and to license them so that they could be sustainable tappers. Also, we have identified they have private lands, um, less on private lands. And actually, um, regeneration of, of lesser when the trees are not harmed is fairly, is fairly high. But when you have destruction of the trees, and another thing we learned through the study is that when the trees are damaged and they're infested with disease, it could actually spread to trees that have not been tapped and further cause decline in the population. So what qualifies a tapper? That they train, that they do sustainable harvesting using the method that we have taught and that they're certified and licensed. Thanks. <clears throat> One more question from Dintas. Can, can we use citric acid, which he says is more environmentally friendly and that, um, it is only that sulfuric acid will yield, is it that only sulfuric acid will yield the results? Sulfuric acid is a potential contaminant to the flora and fauna in the vicinity. Can you comment on this? Okay, well, based on previous research that was done by, by Fauna Flora International and in other countries where resins are tapped, they found that sulfuric acid actually was not harmful to the environment or to the plants at the concentration which we are, we are using, the 5%. And in some previous studies, and I cannot recall clearly if it was citric acids, but some other acids were tried, and it was found that sulfuric acid was the one that yielded best results with regards to resins and exudes. That is why sulfuric acid was used in the first place, based on experience from other countries who extract resins and use them in, um, in industry. So we, at this point, um, I'm not clear whether citric acid can be used, but it was found that sulfuric acid at a 5% concentration is not deleterious, is not damaging. The most is if someone gets it in their eye, could get it cause irritation of the eye and they need to wash it out of the skin. But at the 5%, it does not harm the plant, it does not harm the environment. And that the, the, the resin quantity is quite high using that method and using that concentration of acid. Okay, thank you very much, Nicole, and your, your team for this very interesting presentation and follow-up discussion. Um, we're just about to close your session before we move to the next session. Do you have any closing two cents to add? Well, I'd like to thank, um, well, not myself, but myself and the forestry division would like to thank everyone for the opportunity. And we would like to encourage persons to push green economy. We know that our natural resources like our forests, they play such vital roles in enriching our lives by providing um, ecological services, provisional services. And in light of climate change, the importance of the forest can, can, is, uh, cannot be understated. So it's very important that we have a healthy forest. And if we can sustainably manage it and provide livelihoods for our people, it is something that we should encourage and we should do and we should collaborate to see that it's done. So thank you again on behalf of the Forestry Division for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much on behalf of the participants and all those who have been following. And the Amen. organizers. Yes, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just want to recognize the donors, FFI, Fauna and Flora International, and all of the persons highlighted in the very first presentation. I think it's Sandals, it's Defra, all of them without whom we would not have been able to facilitate this process. So the government of St. Lucia, and to all, thank you so much for facilitating this process, the research, empowerment of people. That's what we're all about at Forestry Division. Thank you. Thank you, your partners are duly recognized. And um, 
as we prepare for our next session, we will just go to a, a short video just to give you some time to drink some water and then we'll just invite our next presenter, Berthia Thomas, to stand by. So we'll now go over to our technical team to present the video. Enjoy the watching. Imagine the world without a Caribbean. Imagine a future with pinnacle remnants of these islands, like sculptures floating on a sea of debris. In the second decade of the 21st century, the Caribbean is once more in a fight for its continued existence having battled forces of imperialism for centuries. The region must now confront the devastating impacts of global warming and climate change. Viewed largely as a region of high middle-income countries, the Caribbean has limited access to external funding. Pockets of poverty persist and are as deep as income disparities are wide. Make no distinction between richer and poorer countries. While visitors to our islands may seem a crippling livelihoods. For us, the effects of climate change on the University of the West Indies, political and professional leaders, and has guided the rich we stand at the forefront of the science on environmental resource management, climate modeling, natural disasters, top 4% of over 28,000 universities in the world, serving 50,000 students across 17 Caribbean countries, International Association of Universities, to lead a global university consortium on SDG 13. Our Global Institute for Climate Smart and Resilient Development. Connecting sustainable projects to funding and to the expertise of researchers and innovators. As a public, comprehensive institution, the UWI has never been daunted by limited means, nor by our vast responsibility to the region. Our allegiance is to continue as a developmental force to nurture the human and social capital. Our young people are environmentally conscious and boldly persistent in holding decision makers accountable. Together, we can make the Caribbean the first climate For us, tackling climate change is not only a priority, it is a matter of our survival. Thank you very much. And we welcome you back to our presentations. We are now on the second part of day two. And this morning we heard from Shelly Ann Cox of UWI, Shana Emanuel of the OECS, and just a while ago, Nicole Laforce Haynes of the Forestry Department in St. Lucia. Our next presenter is Berthia Thomas, community-based participatory approach to vulnerability analysis with adaptation planning for pel pelagic sagasum in the Eastern Caribbean. 
graduate student at the Center for Resource Management in Environmental Studies, SOMIS, at the University of the West Indies, Capel Campus, Barbados, of Pelagic Sagasum, with special emphasis on evaluating community level vulnerability in St. Lucia through participatory approaches. This will facilitate the identification and understanding of various of variations in community vulnerability to pelagic sargassum and guide the adaptive planning process with a Bachelor of Science degree in biology, emphasis in zoology from the Andrews, where she graduated in 2011 with a science and technology officer within the department of such. She has also contributed to the ongoing work on biodiversity, biosafety, coastal lecturer for the University of Southern Caribbean Satellite Campus in Lucia, an assistant examiner for the traveling, shopping, and meeting with all thy might. And the underlying philosophy of life is to be the change you want to see. We hope that through her research to you for your presentation. Yes, thank you thank very you. much. Um, Mr. Charles, pleasant good morning to everyone. Yeah. I'm going to share my screen at this time. Could you just kindly confirm that you are able to see it? Yes, we are confirming. All right. So. Proceed. Wonderful. Thank you again, Mr. Charles. A pleasant good morning to everyone. I would like to thank uh, UE Open Campus, uh, the Department of Sustainable Development and the Center for Resource Management and Environmental Studies at UE for the opportunity to present this research. Okay, the topic for my research is a community-based participatory approach to vulnerability analysis and adaptation planning for pelagic sargassum influxes in the Eastern Caribbean, a St. Lucia case study. And I would like to highlight from the onset that this is a modified version of a presentation I delivered at a seminar some time ago on my ongoing uh, PhD work. And it has been adapted for uh, this open campus con country con conference and made to focus a bit on uh, climate change, which is what we're dealing with here today. Uh, so this is more like an intention to study. For the next few minutes, we will be looking at the following, a background, what is sagasum? Where did it come from? How did it get here? Why is it here? We're going to look at the pros and cons of sagasum and how it is related to climate change. I'm going to share with you the rationale for my study, as well as my research summary, aim and objectives, and I will end with the proposed methodology. Background. In the last decade, the shores of the Caribbean has been inundated with unusual amounts of pelagic sargassum, and that is something that no one can deny. High influxes first began in 2011 and continued in 2014 and 2015, but reached unprecedented amounts in 2018. This record-breaking beaching event of 2018, however, demonstrated what scientists and governments already knew. We had a serious problem with pelagic sargassum, and pelagic sargassum was affecting the Caribbean region at a greater frequency, longer duration, and at a larger quantity. So, when sargassum first appeared, scientists crumbled to understand it. What is it? When did it get here? Why is it here? Where is it here? And how did it get here? So, what is sargassum? Sargassum is a brown marine macroalgae or a seaweed that is naturally found in the warm tropical waters of the Atlantic Ocean. The species associated with the recent inundations are Sargassum flutans and Sargassum natums. These are two species and they are very different. They are completely pelagic. They remain on the open ocean and they're very different from their 
benthic counterparts, which are bottom-dwelling species. Now, the actual sargassum plant, the benthic, the, the benthic species attached to the ocean floor, but pelagic sargassum is different in that it never attaches to the ocean floor. It reproduces vegetatively. The actual plant is no more than 80 centimeters. It's a very small plant, but depending on the sea state, sargassum becomes entangled and can form mats that are several meters wide and lines that are several kilometers long. When did sargassum get here? As we highlighted exactly 10 years ago, first appearing in the Caribbean region in 2011. Why did it get here, which is one of the things we are going to discuss in some more detail. Sargassum, there are many schools of thought as to how it, why it got here. However, the main school of thought is, is as a result of climate change, particularly an elevation in sea surface temperature, coupled with an increase in our nutrient load that has been caused by deforestation and industrialization and so forth where sargassum is originally found in the Sargasso Sea, hence the name Sargasso Sea. However, today it is found throughout the Caribbean region, Gulf of Mexico, Florida, South America, and even West Africa. How did it get here? Again, the literature abounds with various uh, possible transportation pathways, and uh, they are still deciding using various uh, ocean current technology, how sargassum got here. Like anything else, sargassum has both positive and negative effects. Number one, sargassum serves as an essential fish habitat. What that means is that these floating ecosystems provide shelter, nursery, spawning and feeding grounds for many species, including invertebrates, turtles, and even fish species, commercially important species like our mahi-mahi. Number two, sargassum has been shown to cause the nutrient enrichment of coastal vegetation. So as the seaweed decomposes, it supplies nutrients to the generally poor coastal soils that help improve plant growth. Number three, Sargassum contributes to shoreline stabilization or sand dune stabilization. What that means is that sargassum is able to bind the particles of sand, hereby keeping them together and reduces beach erosion, which is very a prevalent occurrence during tropical storms and hurricanes, which are quite, which are natural occurrence in the Caribbean region. Alternative uses, very important here, there are many things we can make from sargassum. Our very own uh, Johannan Dujon has established his company Algas, which provides a plant tonic right here in St. Lucia. Other uses includes uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, so for medicines, nutraceuticals uh, for food. Uh, it can be used uh, to produce biofuels. It can also be used to produce bioplastic. And there are many other possibilities, alternative uses of sargassum. Of course, we will discuss about carbon sequestration in some more detail a bit later. Negative impacts, uh, the most noteworthy is the death of many marine animals, especially our turtles, which are unable to escape the sargassum, the hatchlings, and so they become choked. Additionally, the sargassum covers uh, beaches, and so the regular turtle nesting sites become unavailable. And so there's overcrowding when turtles try to lay. Number two, we have destruction of our natural ecosystems, particularly our seagrass beds and our coral reefs, which become smothered with the sargassum, thus reducing the penetration of light. And so these ecosystems are not able to photosynthesize and so they die. Of course, no one can deny the impact of the foul smelling gas. This is actually um, hydrogen sulfide, which has been shown to have um, many dangerous uh, health effects at certain quantities at, and on vulnerable po populations such as children, the elderly and pregnant women. Some of these include uh, nausea, insomnia, eye problems, uh, breathing problems, dizziness, and even rash and air infections. 
Then we have the transportation of exotic species that uh, ride along the, the Sagassum train as it makes its way to the various countries. And so these species are now introduced in an area where they generally do not have um, any known predators. And so they can have adverse e effects on our environment. Of course, sectoral impacts, very critical to this, to my research, but we will be looking at, um, we will be looking at it's a bit later in some more detail. As you heard in the topic, a key component of this research is vulnerability. And so what is vulnerability? There are several definitions. I mean, the literature abounds with, with different definitions. And of course, the variations arise from the application of the concept across, across different scholarly communities. Now, what, what they're saying in essence is that there is no correct definition of vulnerability. Instead, what we have is a definition that depends on the context and what it is being used for. So according to Antwi 2015, vulnerability is defined as a very useful concept. For what? For understanding, measuring and evaluating the predisposition of people to an environmental hazard. So it could be climate change, it could be flooding, it could be uh, hurricanes, sea level rise, and in this case, sargassum influxes. Ahmed and Kelman in 2018 took this a step further and saw vulnerability as the characteristics and conditions of a community that make it susceptible to negative effects of a hazard. And then it looks at here the sociopolitical circumstances that contribute to the creation and perpetuation of these conditions. Then Sandura et al. again in 2018 saw vulnerability as the ability of a community to cope, recover from, and adapt to external stresses and pressures. Decades before, Kelly and Aga in 2000 had said that vulnerability is the ability to endure, recuperate from, and adapt to external stresses specifically on one's livelihood or well being. In other words, it viewed vulnerability as a soldier who is wounded in battle. And because he's already wounded, the chances of him being further wounded are greater. So the literature has shown that vulnerability comprises three components, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. So exposure refers to all your elements at risk, and it includes your socioeconomic, environmental, and your cultural assets. So that's your people, your infrastructure, your buildings, your roads, your natural resources, your ecosystem services and your livelihoods, anything that can be adversely affected. Sensitivity is the degree to which a person or system is either positively or negatively affected by a hazard. Now together, exposure and sensitivity are termed impacts and they increase one's vulnerability. So the higher your exposure, for example, the more vulnerable you are. Adaptive capacity, on the other hand, is the opposite and it operates counter to exposure and sensitivity. It is the ability of a system to overcome potential damage. That, and it can do so by two, in two ways, by taking advantage of the opportunities before the hazard or dealing with the consequences after the hazard. And so adaptive capacity decreases vulnerability. So for example, you may have someone living very close to the shore, the shoreline, and so the sagasm appears to affect them, so they're very exposed. However, that person may have a job security where they can they make a, a good salary, and so they're able to source uh, insurance for their home and their household appliances. Additionally, that person has a certain level of education that allows them to understand better adaptive measures. And so while that person is more exposed, that person's adaptive capacity sort of counterbalances what we have here and so makes that person less vulnerable. We can compare this to someone who perhaps uh, lives further from the shoreline and so is less exposed, but his present uh, 
economic context or educational background lowers his adaptive capacity and thus makes him more vulnerable. Moving on, sagassum and climate change. Sagassum blooms have been shown to be the result of elevated sea surface temperature. And this is what we use to um, explain the blooms, actually. As with any other plant, and, uh, sagassum is an algae, and so the growth rate of that organism would increase with an increase in temperature. Additionally, from the period 1982 to 2018, the average annual sea surface temperature in the Western tropical Atlantic and by extension the Caribbean increased by 0 0.75 degrees Celsius. And so every, all of these small amounts are significant. So now these hydrological parameters and the changing ocean conditions that result from climate change coupled with nutrient enrichment have contributed to the growth and consolidation of pelagic sagassum. So for example, our elevated sea surface temperature causes the melting of ice caps. This causes a decrease in salinity. Salinity directly affects our ocean currents. And so things that were no longer in, a, in the Caribbean um, oceans are now present. Now, Again, there are several schools of thought for sargassum distribution, but as you can see from the diagram, there are two areas for uh, consolidation, you, two consolidation regions, one of the coast of Africa and one of the coast of South America. And what happens is that it begins to accumulate uh, in the Gulf of Guinea in the spring and then begins to move along with the South Equatorial Current and it starts to accumulate or beach along the east northeast coast of Brazil. Over time, in the early summer, it begins to make its way up north. And so it ends up via the Guyana current in the southern lesser at, um, Antilles. And by the winter, the sargassum makes its way further up north, reaching the northern Lesser Antilles by the North Equatorial Current. And so this is why different places will be affected with sargassum at different times. However, forecasting is possible. And so we are now able to predict that you will have sargassum blooms by so and so, and so people can now be better prepared. Sargassum and carbon sequestration, of course, sargassum, like all other algae, play a critical role in climate change mitigation because it reduces our greenhouse gas carbon dioxide in this case. And so sargassum has the unique ability during very uh, strong winds and heavy mixing of the ocean waters, it quickly sinks to the ocean floor. And so this makes it a very excellent vehicle for artificial carbon sequestration and thus reducing ocean acidification. Now, this study here was done by Jovia et al. in uh, 2020. And it shows what it does here, it, co it co compares uh, the global combined sargassum, which comprises global floating sargassum and global benthic sargassum, and it compares it to three other marine ecosystems mangroves salt marshes and seagrass beds and sargassum has been shown to have a far greater geographic extent and above grass biomass than all these other marine ecosystems as depicted by the figures below the key findings from that research are as follows uh, so they inserted the figures into a boosted regression tree model and they were able to uh, estimate the biomass of sargassum and sargassum was shown to function as a significant carbon stock compared to all other marine ecosystems and of course that would contribute to climate change mitigation and so the aim here is to restore or to manage it in such a way so that it can serve it, the purpose the true purpose and so we come to more or less my research and what I would like to do. Uh, rationale for my study, the, the main methodology employed for this study is the participatory approach. 
And what exactly is the participatory approach? Uh, term the PVA, Participatory Vulnerability Analysis, it encourages and facilitates the involvement of community members, hoping that community members will understand their own vulnerability and utilize that knowledge to experience, to effect change. Additionally, PVA reports that community members are in the best position to identify the complexities of their vulnerability because they are the ones that live with the negative impacts of the hazards daily. Additionally, community members possess the traditional knowledge and so they can tell you the historical patterns of a natural hazard. It targets the poor and the marginalized groups, which we spoke about earlier, that are usually left out of discussions of that nature. We tend to think it's above them. So let's put a policy in place and the people do not embrace it. They don't feel empowered and so they don't move forward. And so it allows community members to produce, to present a united front and say, here is what we need, here is what we would like, and so I can now hold you accountable for something. Why St. Lucia? St. Lucia lies at the forefront of receiving sargassum influxes as the central island on the Lesser Antillian arc of the Caribbean archipelago. It's right there in the middle. It receives lots of influxes. Additionally, uh, something appearing for 10 years is very new in the scientific community. However, a lot of studies have been done on, on its distribution, it, its ecology, uh, species associated, the socioeconomic impacts, but there has been no community level assessment of sargassum vulnerability. And so this is the point of this research. Additionally, St. Lucia is a small island developing state, and so it will allow us to make very useful comparisons uh, throughout the Caribbean region. It will allow the scientific community to better understand the hazards, learn from best practices, and perhaps draw meaningful conclusions. Now, uh, according to Mr. Anthony Filgens of the Department of Agriculture, there are 11 sites along the east coast of St. Lucia from Grosley to Viewfort that have received, that continue to receive regular inundations of sargassum. These are Casaba, Aslavote, Esperance, Denry Bay, Prale Beach, Prale Jetty, Escap, Miku Bay, Lance Captain, Savans Bay, and Sandy Beach. And using a criteria of quantity, duration, urgency, value, and persistence, a matrix was created. And for this research, I will be focusing on three communities, the communities of Denry, Prale, and Miku. Now, I did tell you that there were several uh, sectoral impacts in various countries. However, in St. Lucia, we have major adverse impacts on the fishery sector, the health sector, and the tourism sector. And these adverse impacts have been divided into three categories, physical impacts, biological, and socioeconomic. Of course, due to time constraints, I won't go through all, but you can see the range of ways in which sargassum continues to impact the fishery sector. For example, biological, you have change in fish species caught, change in the sizes of the fish uh, fishes caught. Socioeconomic, because you have now have different sizes and different species, you have different fish spice um, prices. And so now fishers even have to work a little harder because people are, are, are creatures of habit and so they may not want the almo jacks, they may want their flying fish. And so it upsets the balance in so many ways. Of course, uh, tourism sector, you have the unavailability of many water spots. It's, it's aesthetically devastating, it's ugly, it's smelly, it's, it's brown, it's all choked up and people no longer want to walk or fish or use the beach recreationally. And this of course could have serious implications for restaurants and, and, and bars and, and hotels along the coastline. 
and health, they say if you don't have health, you don't have wealth, so you cannot enjoy the fish and the, the, the tourism. So it affects us in so many ways, as I highlighted before. Uh, you might have um, continued exposure, which still has to be studied because the concentrations presently have not been shown to exceed uh, normal levels. However, this is being monitored by the Department of Agriculture. Uh, our Minister of Sustainable Development was actually the parliamentary representative for two of the communities that I'll be looking at, Miku and Prale, has indicated that three of the biggest complaints she has received, the smell, you cannot drive by Prale or Denry or Miku and not know that the Sagasam is there. It has, of course, has affected the livelihoods of the people and the recreational use of the beach. The government of St. Lucia continues to undertake various interventions. In 2017, they established the Sargassum Task Force under the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, this has been uh, met with limited success and there were a number of challenges like funding and equipment and so forth. The government continues cleanups on a needs basis assisted by the National Conservation Authority and community members where possible. Under the CC for Fish project, uh, equipment and tools were provided to village councils to help empower uh, community members to take charge of the cleanups themselves. Also under that project, we have the development of the draft Sargassum management plan in collaboration with UE. Recently, we also have the development of the national fisheries policy which includes sagasa management. The Department of Agriculture has also noted the procurement of hydrogen sulfide meters that it will be using to undertake monitoring. And of course, I have regular monitoring here because as persons who work for technical officers within the public sector, we understand our workload. And so you may have the intention to monitor, <laughs> to monitor the, 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 the sagasum. However, this may lead to uh, being pushed further back because of ongoing work that you have. Additionally, many of these sites, especially those in Grosile, are very far inland and they would require a four by four and to get in there and it's very time consuming. And so they, there are no dedicated or appointed sagasum monitors, so hydrogen sulfide monitors. So what is this research all about? Uh, this research seeks to evaluate community level vulnerability for three communities, Denry, Miku, and Prale. It is going to employ a community-based participatory approach. I will seek to develop appropriate indicators for the three components of vulnerability I highlighted, namely exposure, sensitivity and adaptive capacity. This will then be aggregated to develop a combined indicator of vulnerability index for each community. And so now we can have adaptive planning at the community process. Okay, and this is, uh, we can skip this. This was just an, uh, another paraphrasing of what I highlighted previously as the research summary. So we're looking at a participatory vulnerability analysis to characterize community vulnerability to pelagic sargassum influxes. My research has five main objectives. The first one, as I indicated, is to identify appropriate indicators for the three components of vulnerability, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. Then we will create a composite vulnerability index to characterize that vulnerability. The third thing we're going to look at is what are the economic, social, and environmental drivers that influence or guide appropriate actions for adaptation. Number four, which makes me most excited, is where we're going to hear from the community members themselves. I have termed it the voice of the invisible to effectively communicate how they think and feel to the policymakers. And at the end, all of these will be put together to create a conceptual framework for community specific adaptation and management plans for 
pelagic sargassum that will feed into the current draft national management plan. And so as we wrap up, I am now in my methodology phase where we will be looking, we'll be actually doing the data collection. Of course, this has been halted to some extent uh, by COVID. Nevertheless, we, we press forward. Um, we're adopting a mixed methods approach. We'll be using both quantitative and qualitative methods. Under the quantitative method, we have the community or household surveys and the census data. These will lead to developing the composite indicators. And under qualitative, we have our key informant interviews, our focus group meetings, and the voice of the invisible that will be used to contextualize the numbers that we have. And so at the end of it all, we hope to further analyze the data, submit the, do the write-up, do the various seminars, the defense, and have see this research completed. For me, research, like Albert says, is to see what everybody else sees, but to think what no one else has thought. And it is my hope that through this research that uh, St. Lucia can be further put on the map and we can be used an, as an example to extrapolate for the community vulnerability analyses for the Caribbean. These are my references and I thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your very detailed <clears throat> um, presentation, your, as you see, the research project itself. And I'm sure that we, those of us who are familiar with the Gassum, perhaps just sees um, just a nuisance element of it, but clearly one has to examine the pros and cons, particularly as they have an impact on the communities which are in close contact with that resource. In fact, as was discussed by Shelley and Cox earlier, um, we have to see it as one of the marine resources right now. So um, I will open now for questions from our colleagues. I have one question so far, which I will just ask. Um, is a question to you from Kevin Nathaniel, and he he asks if Given that the is such a nuisance, if we were to remain on the high, if it were to remain on the high seas, how long before it sinks to the seabed? That's part one. And um, he wants to find out about the impact on decreased catch of flying fish. I think that was raised earlier by by Shelly and Cox. Yes. Comment so the, right. The first question is how long it stay, can stay out onto the the sea, right, before it actually gets beached. Right. Right. Okay. Now that would depend on your your sea state. That would in, be, include on, uh, your wind direction, your wind speed, and your ocean currents. It has been shown to get there right away. We have forecasting um equipment now that can show it leaving uh the coast of, of, of West Africa and making its way. So we could say in about two to three months, it will it will get here. But again, this uh, depends on, you may have a tropical storm that makes it get here faster or it takes it off course. And so we cannot say definitively how long it would take here, but we can use predictive models to say how it can, how, what time it, it is expected to arrive. Uh, your second question was, uh, what, sorry? It's the impact on <clears throat> decreased catch of flying fish. Right. Okay. So uh, <laughs> just like human beings, animals have their preferred environmental space. Now, sargassum has been shown to be associated with certain species, particularly uh, juveniles, because it serves as a as a nursery and a spawning ground. It also protects them from larger predators. And so juveniles, that's why the sizes of the fish are actually smaller when they're associated with, uh, when you, you catch them with sargassum. However, the sargassum itself tends to attract your almos, your, your, your jacks and your mahimai or your dolphin fish. It has been shown not to really encourage 
flying fish. We're not too sure why, but because of, of this new environment now, the fish no longer come as they, they came before. And this has had a significant impact on the economy of many places that rely heavily on flying fish, for example, Barbados. As to say uh, why, the, the, like to look, explore fish behavior, I guess more research would have to be done in that type of, um, in that area. I cannot speak to that because I'm not a, a fisheries expert. Uh, however, it would, it would be, it's a nice gap and it would make for some good research, yes. Any other questions? Yes, we, while we're waiting, I just want to ask one, while your, your preliminary research and assessment um, does focus on communities, did right, you, right. is there any sense of the impact on the social life of communities in terms of the access to the resource, the beach resource as for recreation and so forth? Okay. Um, this is one of the, these are some of the things we hope to answer through the community survey. I'm aware that uh, UN ECLAC is doing a socioeconomic study on um, the impacts of sargassum in various uh, community countries, community um, Caribbean countries. However, you'd understand that the beach plays a very significant role psychologically for people of the Caribbean. It's a, we enjoy as we, we drive by, we can look at the blue ocean, the blue sky, it's therapeutic. Additionally, we like the freedom of knowing that anytime we can go for a swim, a dip. In addition, uh, the beach also has religious activities for um, um, purposes for certain groups of people, like uh, a certain religious sex with uh, use it for baptism and so it has truly trend horseback riding um just just relaxing after a hard week and so this has had a significant impact on people's psychological and mental well-being knowing that i can no longer use this space i know the prana beach was very famous for beach parties and cook-ups and so forth and now people can no longer do that they're repelled by the scent and the sight and so um, this has had a significant, not just a livelihood impact on the social behavior of people. Okay, I have a few questions. Um, the first one is, is the sargassum problem a threat to the burgeoning CMOS industry? Does it affect the growth of CMOS at the CMOS farms? Okay. Um, does it affect CMOS? Uh, CMOS yes, yeah, CMOS production. Sargassum is, is viewed primarily as a threat um, when it, to the people when it gets on shore. And this is what um, my research focuses on. As it, as it relates to when it is water bound, um, the fishers will tell you yes, because it, it gets in the engines, it damages the, the, uh, the fishing equipment. Additionally, it makes it very difficult to get to established fishing sites. As it relates to its effects on um, um, CMOS, I, I, I'm afraid I cannot speak to that uh, and, its, and its current impact. Okay. I know it affects uh, fisheries in other ways, uh, like I mentioned, the gear, the equipment, the, the engines, the, the fishing site, the fish stock themselves, the species, the ecosystems. But if it can affect coral reefs, just a hypothesis here and it can affect uh, the seagrass beds, perhaps it can get entangled because I know they plant it out into the open ocean, perhaps it can get um, entangled in these areas and, and make it worse. But you would have noticed that this year we've had a little lull in the in, in Sargassum and it's expected, right, it's expected to return like March, April based on the summer conditions. And so there are times it would affect it would have different effects on different industries based on the quantity and the time. A, a, um, intervention from Clarence Henry of the OACS. He asked, thanks for the presentation. Interested in understanding your thoughts on sargassum may in fact lead to a net positive effect. This may in fact influence your engagement with the selected community. Can you comment? Yes, um, yeah. a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, critical to this research is something called transformational adaptation, 
where we want to use something that was once viewed as, as negative to bring about benefits to everyone, particularly to the poor. So for example, part of this research in, involves asking the people, what would you like to see happen? What would you have liked to use the sagasum for? And what supporting, what sort of support would you have um, needed? So for example, right there in January, um, Algas, you would need your collectors, you would need your baggers, you need the truckers to carry them, you would need persons to, um, I guess, take them out when they think, wash them, dry them. And so you have a whole burgeoning industry. And so people that now viewed it as a negative thing can actually see it as a, a blessing. And so this is one way to deal with it, just like with this, the, the, the sea lion concept. In, in other words, you take something that was viewed as negative and you make it into something. This is closely tied with um, equi equitable resilience, where you now have resilience across the, the board. And again, we're targeting the poor and the marginalized so that no one is left behind. So a fisherman who has now lost his livelihood because of the sargassum can go into an alternative livelihood now and look at maybe using the sargassum for composting, using the sargassum for biogas digesters instead of pig manure. And so as, because it's fairly new, it allows uh, for room for innovation and, and creativity and exploration of new uses. So a very good point. It's, it's something we'd, we'd like to move towards to allow persons to view it not so much as a nuisance, but what you can use it for. However, something one challenge to this is the unpredictable nature of sargassum. While we have the forecasting models, there is no guarantee that it's here to stay. So you don't want to invest in a large um, biogas um, initiative and then after three years it has stopped coming. And so what happens to uh, your profits and your loss and that sort of thing. So thank you, uh, Dr. Henry, for your point and I hope it was answered. For your question, I hope it was answered. Okay, any comments from the Zoom floor? Um, there is a comment from Cuthbert Nathaniel who says, because flying fish requires floating objects to lay its eggs, one can expect the flying fish to lay its eggs on, in the sargassum. Prior to the influx of sargassum, the stock of flying fish has reduced, was already reduced. Um, perhaps that's for another okay. set of experts to, to, to comment on. Yes, perhaps. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not able to speak about sargassum, and the, I, I just can report that, that yes, that the the certain fish species and sizes and uh, composition has changed. But as to to why exactly, we might have to delve a little deep, deeper into fish behavior and pelagics and that sort of thing. Yes. Okay, so let me, if there are no further questions, um, let me thank you both here for your presentation. Yes. Um, Clarence did say his thanks for the response. It was very clear. Okay, and I'm great. sure the others who asked questions got the response questions of COVID that you will probably find some. Hey, Dr. Charles, and as the research progresses, yes, I have the opportunity. Thank you. Presentation by Crispin and Disaster Resilience speaking on the Eastern Caribbean Solar Challenge in the fields of fisheries and environment officer. In that bachelor's degree in the development studies, natural resource from the University of East, the University of the West Indies, Evil Campus. Thank you, Chair. And good day, everyone. Good day. I'm going to show that you see my screen. Confirmed. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to put it into presentation mode now. Okay, good. All right. So thank you again for being here today and um, I'm going to speak on the Eastern Caribbean's Solar Energy Challenge. It is, uh, we're looking at demonstrating climate leadership under the Caribbean NDC Finance Initiative or NDCFI. And once again, it's a pleasure. So without further ado, well, in terms of background, I think it is well known that the OECS is particularly, the OECS region is particularly vulnerable to climate change. 
and member states are striving to build climate resilience and to transition to low carbon economies. Our sovereign member states, that's like our independent member states, are seeking to implement and enhance their nationally determined contribution to NDCs under the Paris Agreement, while the UK overseas and the French territories are pursuing complementary strategies. Despite the minuscule greenhouse gas emissions, for example, St. Lucia, in 2010, I think it was uh, emitted 0.0015 or 1% of global emissions. Uh, our member states aspire to demonstrate leadership by pursuing impressive emission reduction targets. The socioeconomic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic are particularly harsh on small island economies with limited fiscal room to maneuver and heavy dependence on tourism. And um, for, with those reasons in mind, bilateral support and private investments in the green recovery are critical. Now, if we use the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions of the respective member states as a point of departure, I think we can look, we can start to look at, at what some of the needs are, well, what some of the targets were with regard to emissions reduction, and, um, and also look at, at what is needed to, to actually operationalize these. Now, let me hasten to say that I'm using the first NDCs or the initial NDCs of the member states because um, some countries have some countries have actually released the second NDCs like Grenada and St. Lucia, but I think that the, the, I used a snapshot of the initial NDCs to I can use that for a particular reason, which I'll, I'll explain for in a while. Sorry. So if you look at Antigua and Barbuda, their first NDC was submitted in, in, Jan, in um, September 2016. They're looking at energy efficiency standards for import, sorry, efficiency standards for importation of oil vehicles and appliances, finalize technical studies to construct and operationalize a waste to energy plant, achieve an energy matrix with 50 megawatts of electricity from renewable sources, etc. Dominica looked at reducing its emissions by 17.9% of 2014 levels by 2020, 39.2% of 2014 by 2025, and 44.7% percent of emissions by, of 2014 by 2030. Grenada, 30% of 2010 levels, 40 by 2025, and 40% of 2010 emissions by 2030. St. Kitts, 22% business as usual. In other words, what it would have been if there had been no efforts to control emissions in 2025, so to reduce by those by 2025, 35% by 2030. St. Lucia, 16% by 2025. 23% um, compared to BAU by 2030. And St. Vincent looking at 22% of business as usual compared to 2010 by 2025. So as you can see, they're quite an ambitious, some quite ambitious targets in terms of emissions reduction, reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases that globally that contribute to global climate change. Now, when we look at this at the sectors, what are the key sectors that were considered in the in the NDCs? Um, first of all, energy, the power sector, so to speak, that was, that's by far the, the most important sector. The next important one is transport. There was also water, land use, waste management, and agriculture. These are some of the other sectors considered in the NDCs. But if you look again at continuing, continuing with respect to mitigation, sector targets and costs, and looking at the estimated costs of implementing the NDCs, for mitigation alone, that is, that's reduction of, of emissions, not talking about adaptation at all, talking purely mitigation. Antigua and Barbuda, 220 million US dollars by 2013, 99 million for Dominica by 2013. Grenada, 161 million US for 2025. St. Kitts, not stated, 218 million through 2030 for St. Lucia. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, not stated. So now, if you tally these up, now, let me just also state that the, the common consensus is the consensus is that the estimates were cons on the conservative side. But if you look at, at those figures, these 2015-2016 NDCs, and given the estimates, we're talking about over, we would be probably talking somewhere to close to one billion US dollars needed to implement all the NDCs. Now, there, one of the reasons I use the Initial NDCs and, and not updated like for Grenada and San Lucia is that apart from the, the need for comparability, but also to indicate that thus far, 
it is fair to say that the bulk of those resources, those financial resources required to implement those NDCs has not yet flowed into the region. And it is also worth noting that the NDCs by most countries were conditional, in other words, are contingent on the receipt of external resources to support implementation. In other words, we're not, you know, we want to do this, but we can only do this if we get the support we need. So, recognizing that energy and renewable energy is a key component of NDCs, and uh, most countries, all the countries, so to speak, are looking to scale it up. Um, an increase in, renew in renewable energy not only reduces dependency on expensive energy imports, but can also create, create much of commitments. While the use of solar energy is gaining traction, private sector engagement and the further development of a deliberate private sector role in the implementation of NDCs remains limited, as does business awareness of NDCs more generally. In fact, the, over the years, um, the tendency has been to be to believe that governments have the primary responsibility for climate change in general and for addressing it. So, I mean, you know, the perception is that, okay, you go to Paris, you go everywhere and negotiate. So, you know, it is your job to do it. But we also recognize that the resources needed, and which would be pursued by government from bilateral and multilateral sources to implement those indices has not necessarily been forthcoming. So there is a role for the private sector. And at the same time, the need for significant private investment to fund the transition to climate resilient, renewable energy powered economies that enable sustainable development while rapidly and effectively reducing greenhouse gas emissions is commonly recognized. So uh, it is, you know, that is, is coming to the fore now. People recognize that governments can do it alone is a role for private sector engagement. Several initiatives and partnerships to catalyze private financing for renewable energy, RE, and energy efficiency projects are underway, including support for the preparation of investment projects, but still significant funding gaps remain. So with that said, we now look to our solar energy initiative for the Eastern Caribbean. But you may well ask, why solar? Why not wind? Why not, you know, um, wave energy, etc.? Now, without any prejudice to those other to those other forms of renewable energy, increasing the the use of renewable energy to effectively reduce greenhouse gas emissions demonstrates energy and climate leadership. But solar, in particular, is increasingly accepted as a viable and price competitive alternative source of energy, and the prices of, for example, um, solar panels has decreased sharply and continues to decrease with time. It is scalable from household to grid scale. In other words, you know, um, you can put a, a one kilowatt or half a kilowatt panel on, on, a, on a house, on a, on a street light, or you can put, you can build multi, you know, multi megawatt scale um, uh, solar, solar systems. Solar offers opportunities to engage stakeholders at all levels. So we're talking about private sector, uh, government, Households, so it is. It, it is. It is. Um, it, it has wide application across across society. It provides visibility for climate action taken. When you install a solar panel, it can be seen by everyone. It generates measurable results. Some of you who who live in Saint Lucia might recall the 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 um the data panels or the information panels on the systems at the, at the National Trust building and the one on the Castries Market and even Marshall. Community center, which is displayed there. And um, so you can measure the results, you can see how much has been generated both, both over time and what is and what is being generated now. It, it can come in the form of hurricane-proof installations that promote both climate mitigation and resilience. In other words, solar panels can help, for example, hospitals, um, shell, hurricane shelters, etc., to continue to function even during a hurricane. And so they so they, they can fit into what you call adaptive mitigative adaptation or adaptive mitigation, depending how you look at it. In addition, there's an existing and growing pool of expertise in the region. Just recently, through a project that the OECS implemented, 150 or so participants um, or persons were trained in, in the OECS in the in solar installation. So we're looking now at an NDCFI initiative for collective leadership on solar energy. So what is the NDCFI? Okay, the Caribbean NDC Finance Initiative is a joint initiative of the OECS Commission and the Government of St. Lucia. It was established in 2017 with political support from the UNFCCC, that's the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, 
and under the auspices of the Global MDC Partnership. And I never tire of, of thanking the, the German corporation GIZ for the kind support in helping us to get the, the NDC FI on the ground. The NDC FI aims to advance and accelerate NDC implementation and the Caribbean climate and climate and Caribbean climate action and has initiated a non-traditional engagement that includes governments, development partners in the private sector. You recall my saying earlier that the private sector has not traditionally been involved in those conversations. Now, through an Eastern Caribbean Solar Initiative, the NDCFI aims to contribute to the region's efforts to implement NDCs and complementary actions. So, what would be the aim and objective of an Eastern Caribbean Solar Initiative? Well, the aim is to increase deployment of renewable energy technologies in support of national, regional, and global goals to increase climate resilience and towards keeping global temperatures temperature increase within 1.5 degrees Celsius, as called for under the Paris Agreement. The objectives are to raise awareness about renewable energy options and promote opportunities to take action that, demonstrate, that demonstrates energy leadership. Galvanize action get towards contributing to the Eastern Caribbean's efforts to transition to a low carbon economic zone through a participatory approach. Establish the Eastern Caribbean as a region dedicated to climate solidarity and action and solidify the NDCFI as a platform that delivers meaningfully on climate action. So the proposed approach is to secure bilateral support and investment in small to medium scale solar installations in public facilities, solicit and secure private sector investment in, in small and medium scale PV installations on private facilities in the Eastern Caribbean, solicit and foster public and private sector measures to support and facilitate the deployment of solar in the Eastern Caribbean. So with that, I'm happy to introduce the Eastern Caribbean Solar Challenge. That is the official name that we've adopted. And so just to explain the strategic approach. So firstly, we're, securing, we're looking to secure bilateral support in small to medium scale solar. So for example, we're looking to establish a grant window that is open to all legitimate pledges and directly solicit bilateral and multilateral partners to contribute. For example, you can request country X to provide one installation for a public facility in each of its Allied member states in the Eastern Caribbean. Okay, and uh, the benefits will be direct contribution to national NDC and re renewable energy targets, recognition for donor and, and, and the member state, increased sense of ownership, etc. Then to solicit them to secure private sector investments in SMS uh, installations, small and medium scale installations. So you establish a private sector window that is open to all private sector pledges for action in the private sector. For example, invites bank x to install a pv system on, on at least one of the buildings that it owns in each member state where it operates and then so there will be direct contribution to the targets corporate um social responsibility recognition green leadership you know you know branding so to speak or recognition and so on and financial benefit to the private sector in other words we're not asking you to do this for charity do this for yourself of course if you want to contribute to a public sector a public um sector facility that's welcome as well then we're looking to solicit and foster private sector and public sector measures to support and facilitate the deployment of solar in the Eastern Caribbean. So for example, um, we will look at establishing a facilitation window and open to financial and allied institutions, insurance, and also government. For example, the, indig the indigenous banks in the Eastern Caribbean could jointly announce a special, a special loan facility, or you know, they could also they could do it individually as well. So we can say, well, as at least I know one, one finance facility in which has done, they established a special finance facility. Another bank has indicated informally that they're willing to, to support the challenge by establishing a loan facility, that's a commercial bank, a loan facility for you know, householders who want to um, put PV on their homes. Okay, So that would be an indirect contribution, but it would also contribute to, to the targets in the long term. Now, the, the, the additional point is that for governments, we're asking governments now to also um, make announcements or pledges to support, for example, give, let's just say they decide that to, they, they could announce that they will allow, they will give a, 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 a post, an income or corporate tax rebate for installations on, house, on houses and so on. So that could ease the, you know, ease the, the, the financial cost of, of installing, by you know, by you can get some, 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 some reimbursement or, or rebate. For, for having that. And insurance companies from the, going back to the private sector could also, for, for example, give um, 
give special, have special packages for people who wish to ensure the, the, the beeping solutions. And the last component, because we also need the body out, is, is to foster action at the household level and to establish a household individual, individual window to encourage households to register their actions, to take advantage of the, of the loan facilities and, and other facilities made available by government in the private sector. So some critical next steps. So we have already started our engagement with key partners and stakeholders. So we're going to scale this up now. This is not necessarily sequential or it's not necessarily in this order. Some of these actions are taking place in, in parallel. Um, we want to ensure conceptual and technical robustness. In other words, we want one of the things that we've, we, we know from in the region is that um, when some solar installations have, have gone to have gone to see in the sense that they've been established, they start running them, you know, maybe the, the monitoring, um, mon the monitoring panel, you know, goes there, it's, it's not, it's not maintained, there's, there isn't routine maintenance. And so we don't want that to happen where things that, you know, systems are put on private, public buildings in particular are not maintained. So these are some of the things that we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to make sure that it, it's, it's, that the, that the, the, the whole challenge is fit for purpose at the national level to make sure that you know, governments and so on, you know, that we, we are sensitive to the, to the policy limitation or the policy constraints and so on in the respective countries. Um, we also want to, one of the things is we want to put together a robust system for monitoring the, you know, the, 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 the fulfillment of pledges and promises so we can get something measurable. And related to that, we, we are looking, ideally, to set up to, to establish national targets. So, and we putting an initial timeline of the end of 2023 to to you know to kind of record our achievements in this regard in terms of shifting the back. And um, one of the things that we will do is put a robust monitoring system so that if say Bank A, to use my example, installs 25k on five buildings or whatever, then that can be recorded. So there's some sort of measuring reporting and verification that is robust. And we can see that, you know, if, if we've moved the data by one megawatt total installed, then, you know, that is, you know, we can, we, it's not just something happening in a vacuum, but it's being tracked by someone. And of course, we, we that will require some country level reconnaissance and baselining. Um, so we have to work with our member states to, to verify, for example, in identifying buildings that will be suitable for the installations, right? And then, of course, we're looking to officially like, launch a challenge. And like I said, some of the things, even after we launch the, the challenge, um, there will be there will be some of, some of the work will be going on. So before and after the challenge, uh, sorry, after the launch. So that is so. These are some of the next steps that we're looking to do, and um, we certainly be working for member states and with our partners. You know, in, you know, even more more closely as time goes by. So with that, um, I just want to say. The name and the logo will be coming out. You'll be hearing it much more in the coming days and weeks. And with that, I want to thank you. Well, we want to thank you very much, Christine, for, <clears throat> for your contribution. I think it was it is indeed a challenge. I'm sure we will have questions, so stay, stand by. Considerations to promoting and facilitating solar Thanks, Donatian, my friend. Thanks for the question. Um, well, yes, the idea is that if governments, for example, are making, will put concessions and will agree to take an additional step, for example, put rebates, so on, you know, on solar installation, commercial basis, then hopefully they would be able to, to get some additional support and additional support as far as the, the, the policy and the public sector or private sector, but um, um, programs and, and facilities. Well, it has, has a lot to do with the, the sort of overarching institutional arrangements for producing solar energy. Is the, the legal arrangements related to patching into the grill, into the grid and net metering issues and so forth. Going solar to become financially a viable project you have to go to a scale where you can actually solar up your entire bit of, of energy. You're looking at 
the, 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 the policy regime, in, at least one policy, you can only install up 25K, 25 kilowatts on, on any one facility, right? One um, private facility. And for some people that is not economic, for some people it's just proliferating. You'll see that, you know, despite the limitations, you'll see people, you know, installing. Now, one of the other things that is, that is, is coming to the fore now is all issue of stock of agriculture and so on. If you have, for example, a, a to solarize that, battery power allows, which used to be pretty prohibited, okay? So you can stand free of the grid. And in fact, that is net metering. Now we have to look at this, this net metering. It says your, your, your meter spins one way, right? When the dial is spinning the other way. So that is one system. Net, net to lose it, to, to lose it, like in the case of San Lucia. Net building where you, you, you set in to have that on the system. But with, so despite the limitations, where there is scope to do some, there's scope to do work. And again, some people are choosing right certain aspects. Some people are choosing to solarize their, their lighting, for example. You know, some people, are, in other words, their flood lighting, et cetera, take that off the grid entirely, so to speak. So as I said, there are constraints, there are limitations, and it varies from country to country, but even then, people are choosing to take certain options, go off the grid or no combination. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, can I see something? Yes, Jess, go ahead. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Christian. I just have one question from the perspective of the uh, small person in the rural community. Uh, we, have, we had a project in Trozel where three of the beneficiaries who had been paying to select as a consumer for two years who was on their, their family's property for 30 years or so, uh, entered the low-income people, they were, their homes were fully solarized, but they cannot connect to the grid because of the single variable that they do not own the property, yet they have been living there for, for 20 and 30 years. I am trying to understand why this is so. Now, if the argument is that these people have moved from consumers to producers and that connecting to the uh, 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 the, the, the low select system could cause some kind of variability, voltage, whatever, and so on. Is this, is this the argument, first of all? And if this is the argument, is this, has that really happened in, in Lucia? I'm trying to find a way to, to, to get the, the powers the poor people of San Lucia connected to the grid in rural parts of San Lucia, yet most of them don't own land. They are on, 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 on family land. How do we get around that, Chris? Are there any examples you can help us with? Jess, thanks for that question. I think and that's a very, very useful question. Actually, I think um, that question goes beyond the, the realms of purely um, solar, in other words, irrespective of the form of energy. Um, the whole issue of, of land ownership or tenure and the ability to, to connect to the grid. That is something that will have to be addressed at a, at a wider policy, policy issue. And it, it goes beyond the, the immediate scope of what we try to do. But it's a very, very valid question. Um, I, think, um, I, I think also that, you know, when, you, <laughs> when, when we look at these things, there, there, is, there are questions that go, like I said, purely belong electrical and power and so on and and go into the whole issue of of general access from us from a broader socioeconomic standpoint okay and i think governments have to address this but i think also we have at least certain solution we have a national utilities regulatory commission which may have to take up some of those questions as well so but but it's a it's a it's a key question i mean i've heard the issue about that, that point about people not being able to connect because they don't own land and that, you know, or they don't own the property. And that is a, that's a, a, a very deep, or it's, it's a long standing issue. And I think it's something that governments will have to take a position with respect to the, you know, how they, how they, they, they approach the utilities. Uh, Chris, can you see, can you see a lead role in this by a uh, similar way the UCS has done in the past? By creating template legislation for planning and for template uh, or, or, or the issue of lower socioeconomic groups accessing such 
a solar because it's really a differential that I don't I don't I don't like it. It, it really discriminates and it affects um, solarization at the rural community level where we work, as you know. And we are trying to you know so and you know the problem in solution of land. I mean, <laughs> past five businesses have studied the issue of land and the complexity of land ownership in Zanusha and the issue of family die and that family, great great grandfather of the great great grandfather of the great and that own it and pass it and so on, you know. So we, we need to make this an issue that has to be resolved as soon as possible. Yes, Charles. I, I I fully understand and I can you know I can I can agree to that. Well, I think you know I'll be happy to to bring that to my to my colleagues who you know who deal with energy directly. Um, but I, again, when you go when you look at this. The whole ten, right? Six, six years, and they can't, you know, they can't be agreement. Even who is who is the the um, the, the ex, you know, what's the word again? I'm trying to remember that. the 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 person who is a, who 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 is the executive of another of, of another term. So again, it it's while it manifests itself in what you're doing with regard to energy, it also you know manifests itself that probably needs to be addressed in a broader way. But you, again, your point is noted, and I would be happy to refer that to my colleagues. Thank you very much, Crispin. Um, I mean, the, 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 the questions, and the first one is the relationship between this challenge and the work that was done by the OECS Commission under the age acronym for the, um, the acronym. But it has to do with the, the regulation and development of energy. They didn't call it electricity, but the energy sector. And it, I think some phase of the project was to address the issues of connection has to be re resolved because, you know, right now we have to leapfrog into the future, not do it piecemeal as Giles was suggesting. There are a lot of small complications which would get in the way that, um, that we haven't, you know, we're not forecasting. And there, there may be some unintended con consequences of some of the other issue issues, apart from apart simply from the sort of, sort of small, small scale, scale production, production issue. issue. Um, but um, there are the, the issues, issues of the of framework, framework, the institutional, the institutional arrangements to which this, this, this has, to, has happen. to happen. And, and perhaps, perhaps you need to, to give that to that. Even despite the limitations, there is already interest, okay? And for sure, so if, 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 if we're looking, looking even to get the, the, let's just say we start with the government, right? Let's just say we would, we're looking at, let's say we, even if we get 50, 220, 9 or 10 member states, you're talking about, that's half a megawatt already. Okay, okay, that is significant. Not some more. And then I know there are some private people who are interested. Some have already done it, but you know, put, it put solar there on. Then you can, despite the challenges. Now, getting back to you on the on the Sarah thing. Yes, yes. The, the I know, but only only, only in only two countries, countries um, really, really followed up with the with Sierra that was and Grenada. I, I didn't mention Grenada earlier, but Nook has, has has. But in the case of Sandusha, which I'm most familiar with, Nook, Nook, Nook the Nook is is a. Um, is, is it has before it? I know there are a number of, of, of matters, matters before it that, 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 that need to be acted upon. So now, um, so so that is is something that that we will have to that, that as member states we have. To, in fact, one of the things that that I made the points I made earlier was about the whole issue of, of making sure that it's internally robust. I made the point about trying to ensure that that we 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 take into consideration in the respective member states. Because member states can be at, at slightly different, or in some cases, very different, um, at different stages than others. I know so a couple, a couple countries have draft legislation. For example, energy legislation that is that is um, that, that is obviously so. Obviously, we have to take into consideration where we are. There are limitations in San Lucia. It's twenty five k, twenty five kilowatts. You were asking that you, were, you made a point about stability, grid stability. I think either directly or indirectly when you were talking about small scale. Um, my understanding is that oh, okay. and utility, you know, utility level of it still take, just using Sandwich as an example, any significant grid instability. So I don't think that is a limitation at this point in time. Um, in terms of, you know, if it, at this point, you know, the instability threshold, I will stop it. Why well, not a situation of, of a differential in the, most of whom I went to school with, of course. Uh, <laughs> sit around a table and put forward ideas uh, like this. And we do not really, um, uh, because here you're confirming it as, as a senior uh, climate change person, 
And I see what can be done, but I suspect the OECS can play a major role if we can put out some, at least some recommendations, you know, because I hate to see uh, our, our brothers and sisters who I can take you to in places like Chorzel and Montrouge and Delta, uh, where, where, you know, where, where they can be solarized just as us up in the north, you know, and, and, we, see, and we see kinds of reasoning. They meet all other requirements except that. And there's no connection, interconnection being given. And there's three of them in a project we have in, in, in Shrozel that has been- Thank you, thank you, Jess. Thank you very much, Crispin. And um, thanks for all those who presented, who submitted comments and questions on your presentations and those before. You were the last man you can think, so. <laughs> and I think you are not out. Okay, so, so I carried my back. It's a pleasure to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, Chad. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you, know you very much. Okay. So um, we're about to wrap up, and I want to just, as we wrap up, and then I'll invite Leslie to say the final remarks, and we'll close off with our usual 1.5 um, message through the creative medium. So Jazz, um, can you just give us a few closing remarks, please? Thank you, Mr. And uh, what a wonderful two days this has been, you know, discussing ideas in climate change, our future, the impact of climate change in our futures, uh, from the fishery sector to the marine sector. And today we are talking about solar. I think these forests are needed in the Caribbean. And it took COVID for us to discover the virtues of virtual <laughs> discussion and presentations. Um, we at the Jeff Small Grants Program will continue to promote such for us. And as you our members are aware, this is on our uh, knowledge fair. Uh, we promise the people of St. Lucia to do it every two years, uh, funding uh, availability. And I believe this partnership with EWI has proven its uh, dividends, has given us the kind of, uh, of, of, of reception we wanted. Um, and uh, we ask our members to tune in for the, uh, the two segments of our Knowledge Fair 2020-2021. Uh, sometime around June will be the third segment, and we're looking forward to a great sweet finale <laughs> around December 13th uh, this year when we are going to have Senusha's first national anti-testing competition that will open up a new niche for us in uh, AP tourism and so on. So thanks again. Mr. Chef, an excellent job done. Uh, Leslie, please convey our, our gratitude and appreciation to your colleagues uh, for, uh, this, for partnership. this partnership. We look, we look forward to other partnerships, other partnerships of this in the kind in the future. future. And, and hopefully, hopefully next, next time, time we do such, such a thing, we'll be, be able to bring our international, international partners, partners uh, like, uh, like Microsoft, Microsoft and all the other organizations globally that I'm sure would want to participate. Thank you very much and best wishes to everybody. And thanks a lot of our sponsors for the Thank you. Thank you very much, Giles. And I um, want to thank all the participants and presenters. I think the presenters uh, do these presentations. Sometimes it takes a little effort. But I think it's more important. Thanks, of course, for the interventions from all those who would from 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 Leslie Crane, um, whichever is first. I believe that the video may come first. And then let's do our video. Oh, Leslie, oh, Leslie is there. Is there. So, so we now invite Leslie, Leslie to give a closing remark. And Formulas for your kind words. I would like to reiterate what a wonderful two days it has been for us here. Of course, the courage dissemination of that research and, of course, ultimately to seek to promote F. SGP, UNDP for partnering with the UWI Open Campus and for sponsoring this conference. We could not have done it without you. Uh, Giles, for your active participation today, we know that you have been torn between the two con that you made the time to so actively join the National Steering Committee. As a member of our UWI Open Campus St. Lucia Local Organizing Committee, I think we would all agree that Mr. Charles has done an excellent job over the past three days, ensuring the smooth flow of events um, from the opening and uh, on Monday and for over the last two days. And uh, Mr. Charles has given yeoman service and we are very, very grateful for that. Reiterating their dedication to the research that they provided on St. Lucia and of course the wider region 
and we thank them for answering our call and uh, making their various presentations. Of course, all of these presentations were very stimulating, enlightening, and most importantly, based on solid scientific research. And we look forward to receiving the finished presentations and to working with you towards the publication of the same, and hopefully using them as part of the solution to the many climate change issues plaguing St. Lucia and the wider Caribbean region. So again, thank you all of our presenters. Without you, there would not have been a conference. Thanking the members of the local organizing committee, Mr. Ember mentioned sorry, local party in Walcott Fox and from Dr. Cedric Van Mierbeek, and we have a collective for putting us in touch with Ms. Lena Demwolf, who gave her presentation on climate change and neotropical pollinators. Again, thank you for richly accepting our invitation to be our keynote speaker on Monday. On, uh, and uh, much again, Dr. Fletcher, thanking CYEN, which is open between the various partners, uh, and also to CYEN and to the Jeff SGP, UNDP, for the use of their various 1.5 to stay alive promos. Regional UWI technicians, in particular, Mr. David Foster and his colleagues, Mr. Patrick L. Felix and Kevin George, for providing the crucial tech support for all presenters from across the miles. A special thank you to Mr. Richmond Felix and his company, Carib Web, for providing the streaming for the conference. A special thank involved, we thank Ms. Um, Siguthani Bryan, uh, our local marketing um, officer, I'm all excited, and of course, we thank Accela Marketing for their expertise in ensuring. I do hope I haven't forgotten anyone. A wonderful, wonderful three days, and uh, we are supposed to further collaboration with the Jeff SGP UNDP and all of our partners. And uh, we say thank. You. And just, just to remind, to remind you, you that, that you. you have been, in case you didn't realize that, visibility in our region. We have online evaluation, and then I hope that we see very soon some time to continue discussing these issues which are put into the development of our region. Creativity and innovation, Alish Community Spirit, Alish The People's Knowledge Fair and the UE Open Campus St. Lucia Country Conference 2021 For conference on the 16th and 17th That's not all Experience St. Lucia's first national Honey Bee Show training workshop On the 15th and 16th Come learn from a leading international expert Everything you need to know to compete in December In our first ever national honey show Registration is open now The People's Knowledge Fair and UE Open Campus